Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, William Burnett, and I'm, I'm sitting here with John Barclay, and uh, he's our, our next guest on Talk Video. Um, welcome to Greenpoint. Thank you for having me. What's it like to leave um, your neighborhood? Um, it's, it's nice to get out of there. Uh, on occasion, there was a, um, a, uh, a notable singer-songwriter right outside um, of William's door, and uh, that was exciting. I haven't seen something like that in a minute. Hey, hey, he's not bad. Yeah. Did you give him some money? I didn't, no. I just tried not to make eye contact. I never give those buskers money. I don't know why. I don't yeah. ever give beggars money. Is that bad? Does that make me a terrible person? I don't think it makes you terrible. You know, I <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't but think it makes you, you terrible. But do you give people money when you walk past them? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. Not, not, not generally. Not like not people with acoustic guitars, though. <laughs> not the regulars. Not yeah. the Not the the neighborhood. Uh, uh, whatever. All right. <laughs> so, um, I, I, you're, you're, not, you don't really know what's going on here. I just invited you over, and you said that you're willing to do weird stuff. So uh, I'll explain it to you again. We talked about it a little bit before. Mm -hmm. Is that this is a, uh, you know, uh, we're going to talk about music, and uh, I'm meeting with people that are involved in whatever this thing is that we're involved with now. Sure. I don't know what to call it, but it, there's something going on, and uh, we're just kind of talking about the history of of uh, people, where they came from, and what what roles they played, and you know, stuff that happened along the way, and uh, the idea is that uh, people watching or listening. Uh, feel like they're part of the conversation and uh, they don't need friends anymore. Cool. You know, you can just stay home and listen to podcasts and and sure. never leave the house again. So, um, let's uh, start. Your um, young young John Barclay. Uh, uh, he was born in uh, I don't even know where. I was born uh, uh, like Anaheim, outside of uh, L.A. Um, That's California. California. Yeah, that was in 1982. All right. And uh, you want me to tell I my? Yeah, I just I don't know. However detailed you want to get, I can I can. If it gets too boring, I'll sure. let you know. Yeah, my uh, my <laughs> my mother is from here. My father's from Alabama. He was in the Marine Corps, so I moved around uh, shitty towns uh, uh, my my whole childhood. So I moved from a uh, I, I was I was born in Anaheim, and I moved. Uh, a couple years later to Hawaii, then to Pensacola, Florida, to 29 Palms, California, in the desert, mm. Jacksonville, North Carolina, Huntsville, Alabama, oh and then geez. I went to college in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then I moved here. I've been here for, I think, a little over 13 years. This Is is your is your mom in the military, too? No, just, uh, just my dad. And was. you said he was a Marine. Correct, yeah. Is he retired now? He retired from the Marines, but he's uh, he still works. He's a he's a pilot. He's like a jet pilot. A jet like up for airline or yeah, like private. It's essentially like um, sort of like timeshare for uh, you know jet oh. transportation. So he's flown like it, it's usually like sort of boring business people, but he flew like Martha Stewart and uh, Dave Matthews. Ooh, uh, nice together. Couple no, <laughs> unfortunately not. <That'd> be <laughs> Mm. So so um and wh does he and why why North Carolina are your parents there now or they're, they're uh, no my m my mother actually just moved to Florida but she was up here yeah um and my my father's in Huntsville Alabama which is where he's where from he, so he went back to his roots correct yeah Huntsville they both went back to the roots and now my mom is like uh, fuck my roots I'm going to the beach so she just bought in. Uh, she was an RV on the beach now. So they're not together, yeah. not together Correct. anymore. And, and do you Correct. have brothers and sisters? I have a younger brother uh, and a younger sister. And and are they? Do you, do you talk to them ever? I do talk to them. Yeah. They're okay. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> no comment. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you guess? Are you are you worried about either one of them? Uh, I mean, not notably. You know, I just regular stuff. Yeah, just regular worries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, are they? Do they? Do either of them have like wife and kids or? Both of them are married, and both of them have uh, children and stepchildren as well. Yeah. Whoa, man! And so and I'm like the the, the odd one, yeah. the weird one. Yeah, the weird and one. what what do you what do they what do they think about you? Uh, I'm not really sure what they think about me. It seems like they like me, but uh, <laughs> you'd have to ask them. And where are they at? 
My brother is outside of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, right now, in the in the woods somewhere, and then my sister is in the swamps, uh, right outside Pensacola, Florida. Oh, geez. All right. Yeah. So they're both very, very <laughs> southern. So you had like a real military childhood, like a new school every year, and yeah, maybe getting beat up or or figuring out how to be the cool guy and fit in real quick or. Yeah, I've been beat up a few times. Yeah. <laughs> what was the worst one? Uh, hmm. Was there one that was I like got a bunch, man. I yeah. <laughs> I got uh I got jumped once by some uh some like neo-Nazis, which sounds like pretty cool and tough, except for they were like uh they were like, you know, averaged around like 16 years old. So that part was kind of embarrassing. Most but, of the time, it, I keep that. I, I don't tell people about their age, but they fucked me up pretty bad. And but you were a kid. I was probably no. I was an adult then. I was uh, probably like twenty two, maybe twenty three at the oh, oldest. Jeez. Yeah, they broke my thumb, fucked me up pretty bad. Uh, but I was talking about like maybe like a, a school fight, like in the cafeteria oh, or something. Fi- yeah, there was. Um, or, I mean, like what what happens? Did you have like a like, oh, man, we got to move to Alabama this year. Like, and then you have to, like, try to fit in. And, and, and then, like, somebody just picked you out and didn't like yeah. you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, every time. I mean, it, well, it's it, if you live on a, uh, you know, a military base or you're around a military base, you're, you're friends with, uh, you okay. know, or you're, you're in school with a bunch of boys whose fathers are in the Marine Corps, which is the most aggressive and obnoxious of the uh uh armed forces everybody everything is like uh based around you know combat or whatever so uh, a lot of uh uh like uh, toxic masculinity going on so yeah it's all about fighting and dumb stuff like that so yeah that's kind of so you know. so, so y- um, how, this podcast is, is supposed to be about music how did mm-hmm. music fit into that moving around was it did you were was it a part of your life then moving around and it, you know, helped you find you, you would like look for the other freaks or like go to the record store or, or it just was, um, I, n- not I, I never went to a record store, uh, growing up. I mean, maybe a few times in college and stuff, but, uh, you know, as like a little kid, when most of the moving around, uh, stuff was happening, I was into just like, you know, MC hammer and like Metallica and then, uh, you know, grunge. So the MTV. Yeah, yeah, the MTV stuff. Yeah, then, you know, the grunge thing, like, really uh, spoke to me and my friends. And I was uh, lucky enough that uh, my mother bought me, like, a, a you know, like a, a cheap drum kit. And uh, I guess my best friend at the time, this is in, in like, late middle school. And, and where are you? I'm in uh, Richlands, North Carolina. So you get a drum set. Point. Yeah, I get a drum set. And uh, and uh, I was lucky enough, my friend, he's this like very, very Southern uh, boy. His name was Michael Barbie, and he was like a absolute virtuoso in terms of any sort of uh, musical ability. And uh, he sort of trained me and another friend to... Um, be able to, you know, be like a rhythm section that was, you know, uh, I guess it, it was good enough for, you know, seventh, eighth graders or whatever. So, so you're in a you're in a rock band. Yeah, yeah. It was it started off as sort of like bad grunge stuff, and then uh, it evolved into like all types of really, really bad, you know, s- sort of whatever was trending in like ska or something. No, well, we didn't. In North Carolina, we didn't have, like, a lot of the stuff that, like, in the Northeast or on the West Coast, the stuff that was, like, really trending, it just didn't exist. I had heard it, like, a couple times, ska or, like, emo or hardcore, but the the stuff that was, like, really popular there, because this is, uh, you know, like, in the swamps, small town North Carolina, um... And, you know, it's like a really small school. Metal was always huge and is still but really big. Isn't it? North Carolina is like that's where like Merge Records is. Was that, yeah. was that even did on your radar at all? No, absolutely not. Not, not at no, all. I heard about it in college and stuff. But I was always very anti-indie rock uh, for okay. whatever 
dumb reason. <laughs> well, maybe good reason. I still don't like indie Who knows? rock. Yeah. But uh, North Carolina is also a really big state. Yeah, yeah. So I was on all the way on the, the on southern side. coast. Okay. Um, so, you know, culturally felt very far removed from Chapel Hill or Raleigh or whatever. But also this is like, w- I didn't use the internet at all. Nobody yeah. used the internet. Yeah. Um, so there, there wasn't like, you know, scenes. Uh, it was very local. Yeah, very local. And, and what was the name of the band just for fun? Uh, I was in a number of bands, but the, um, we, the one that like we really focused on was called Junction Groove, which I don't, what, what had happened, and this is something that happened to me, it's so stupid, several times is because me and my friend were, uh, comparatively, especially him, very talented musicians for our age and our mother's spoiled us probably a little more than uh the other kids that live there it's a you know a a, uh, like a really lower class sort of poverty stricken uh (laughs) town that i lived in i i I didn't have it that bad uh but um so we would because we had uh, musical instruments and because we were comparatively talented what would happen is like the older cool kids they all wanted to front a band. So you'd have like a ninth grader who was like on the football team or something, plays like a little bit of guitar, and he's like, hey, you kids, like, I want you to, you know, to be my drummer. And then they like front it, and it's like all about them. And next thing you know, they're like rapping and screaming. And, you know, then they named the band Junction Groove, which like I was against, but this kid (laughs) was like four years older than me. You know, he's, you know... He has sex with women. He, like, sells weed and shit. He's, like, calling all the shots. Wow. So that happened to me. Uh, Early on. Se- several times <laughs> where, you know, there, it was a bit of a trade-off. It was kind of like a sugar daddy thing. You know, I would, like, play drums, and they would, like, take me to parties and, like, introduce <laughs> me to, to you know, young ladies and stuff, and it felt uh So now, now we're getting, it, cool. g- now we're getting yeah. into who you are today. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> You can wow. still see traces of uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that origin story. That's, and uh, I just for I like to ask these questions. Are you in, in touch with th- this this virtuoso kid you said that taught you everything? Do you still talk to him or no? I haven't talked to him in a while. I'm I'm Facebook friends with him. He's still a very active musician, but he uh, he you know he's he's married with like children, uh, several children, and he does like sort of stuff like down at the dock or something like that you know plays like, like acoustic stuff but he could play with 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 anybody he's like so talented yeah uh, one time I, I was i was just telling this story but he um you know when we were you know j- just getting out when getting out of um high school he would have all these older guys approach him because he was so skilled and down for whatever and these guys who were essentially James Brown, James Brown was still alive at the time, uh, they were his backing band. And when they weren't touring with James Brown, they had this uh, band called Painted Man. Mm-hmm. And they were all uh, older black gentlemen, like probably, you know, early 60s or something. I don't know, late 50s, I don't know. But it was super, super talented, like funk musicians. And this guy, Michael Barbie, ended up playing drums for them. This, like, uh, you know, like, 18-year-old, like, redneck, blonde kid. Because he was so good. And one time they actually, uh, I'll stop talking about this after mm-hmm. this, but they, they, Michael was like, yo, can can John perform with us? And they're like, what the, what the fuck is he going to do? He's like, oh, he can play the hand drums. So I performed with James Brown's backing band playing, like, these, like, cheap, uh, bongos and like a djembe with the shaker. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of outfit did you wear? I, you know, I, I can't remember, but Just it was regular clothes. Cer- yeah, it was certainly like really bad fashion time. <laughs> I think it was like around like the time of like hemp necklaces were like oh, so really the, cool. So this is from. like a '96 or something. No, this is later. This is like 2001, oh, maybe. Geez. Yeah. <laughs> this is like a O Town. Yeah, I guess it's when like uh, the jam bands were like really taking off. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I, I, I missed that. I was yeah, lucky. I you, was yeah. into indie rock or something. Yeah, see, it completely <laughs> dominated 
the town where where I lived, unfortunately. It's wild. And if you wanted to do anything sort of outside of that, like, and, and this you was just didn't have a choice. 2001 is before you're in college? or No, I'm in college. You at just the time. started college, yeah, just so started you're college. like a freshman or sophomore or something. Yeah. I was at Cape Fear Community College, actually. And you went and you graduated from there? Or, or you moved on to a... a I, I transferred to uh, University of North Carolina, Wilmington. That's a smart thing that I think people don't do these days. Is You do the two years community college and then you only have to pay for... It's much cheaper. Yeah, you get absolutely. the same degree. Yeah, very cheap. I don't know why totally. people don't do that. Because, I mean, like someone your age, you're not in college debt. Cor- no, I, I, I got zero college debt. And then peop- other people I know that are probably maybe a little younger than you, they owe sixty grand. Oh yeah, for sure. So um, so so those of you listening, you should use your community colleges. Definitely. I would. What I mean, college. I uh, wait. What what was the name of the community college again? Cape Fear Community College. Cape Fear, and that is a uh, um, <laughs> what happens at Cape Fear Community College? Was there like a radio station, or you were? J- it's just oh, absolutely, just nothing. cruising through. Yeah, nothing cool at all. Nothing cruising cool. through, hanging out with your friends. Yeah, it's like rock and roll high school. You know, you just like hang out, smoke weed, go to class. Talk to girls. So it's like you know, high school. Eat pizza. You know, it was like really slack. And then, and then, univers- uh, North University of North Carolina. That's Raleigh. Where well, is it? The the, the no. main one is Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. Uh, but I went to uh, Wilmington, which is like a beach, uh, mm. like a beach horse girl sort of campus. Oh, Jesus, I didn't know you were such a hillbilly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no response. Uh, I guess. <laughs> hope that wasn't an insult. Um, no, no, not at all. I'm um, trying to embrace that yeah, part of my identity. Well, why not? You know, there's not a lot yeah. of, you know, there's different kinds of freaks. So, so, <laughs> all right. So, you go to college. Then the next, you know, you w- went to this other school. It, it, was that any more, or, or you're just cruising through? And what what are you studying? I went to school for writing. So I was, uh, I was uh, planning on pursuing journalism. Uh, and I, I w- like wrote at the time it was before like the, the bad economy stuff and yeah. the recession. And, uh, it was also before, uh, you know, it was when print media was doing, but still doing really well. And we were like learning about all this internet shit. But uh, is this after nine eleven now? Uh, this is like during. So nine eleven yeah. happened while you were in college. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, so d- was was anything, I mean, it, so- it sounds like this was kind of a, you didn't care, or, or just whatever, you were just cruising through. No, I, I did care at the time. Yeah, I, you know, I... And uh, you, you thought you were going to move to New York and work at Vice or something, or Time? Yeah, Vice. I actually did, I did work for Vice for a little while, so uh, so unfortunately. Was, oh, but, uh, well, there are some... some, some um, but, uh, yeah, something like that. I, I mean, I, I think I went into it thinking I was going to, like, be, like, you know, like, work for, like... National Geographic or, you know, like I wanted to do something like prestigious or something and, and uh, what, like what was civic journalism or something. civic journalism. So you were, you were interested in, in uh, what politics or uh, yeah, poli- geopolitics, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. And so um, you came, you know, or were you playing in bands at this point, too? Or are you like, a uh, yes, same. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I played dudes. in a couple jam bands. No, I think that was when, like, uh, you know, stuff sort of... DFA. Yeah, well, we uh, at at that time we started to hear about, uh, like, what was happening in New York, which was, like, uh, like Interpol and, like, the Juan McLean, and then, like, all these, like, post-rock bands, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, like, stoner metal, and so the... The band I played in was called Emergency Broadcast System. It's a little better than... Yeah, slightly better, yeah. And we were just sort of like this weird amalgamation of like, you know, because there was like, me, there was four of us, and we all had our own like thing we wanted to do, and uh, so we ended up just like sort of combining everything that like, you know, like kind of hip bros thought was cool at the time. So some of it was like you know almost like complete like Interpol ripoff and uh, and then some of it was like you know like Mogwai or whatever you yeah. know like super stony math rock yeah and then we use a synth or whatever you know. and uh, 
are you touring and stuff or, or just kind of we did a couple small tours but you know i mean it was fun it was like you know we, yeah yeah <laughs> came to new york i think twice we played a trash bar oh sweet the yeah. fo- formerly the home of electro clash yeah trash yeah, bar it wasn't it was not lux at that point no it was definitely trash bar i think i just switched actually oh <laughs> wow you just missed it yeah just missed it man. man and so you end up in new york city Correct. And you're you're working uh, immediately. You go to Vice and say, "Give me a job." No, no. So uh, I got here, and um, I, uh, f- you know, the first week I went, I got here. My my big fear was uh, if I'm not if I don't get a job, I don't have any sort of like real savings, and you know, I, I didn't have parents that would really yeah. back it. Um, so I, I I went to a temp agency as soon as I got here. And they gave me the, like, uh, you know, they're reading my resume or, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, we can see that you're into, you know, you want to, you know, you're more of a creative thinker or whatever. So you don't want to just be behind a desk. You want to, like, you know, challenge stuff and, um, you know, whatever, like a magazine job, editorial or something. I'm like, yeah, that would be cool, whatever. And they give me a job uh, just doing data entry for uh, a publishing company called uh, american lawyer media (laughs) which they just did like all uh things uh law related publishing they have several magazines and i worked there i worked two separate jobs for them for like a year and a half and where were you living at this point i was living uh right by the base of the bridge in south side williamsburg okay jeez (laughs) yeah and so now, at this point, it's 2003 or so or something, four? Mm, no, it's uh, probably 2005 or six. I Honestly, I don't even know. Yeah, it's a little hazy. It's like 12 years ago. Uh, I don't know what that means. 2007, then. Is that right? I think so. It's 2019, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so around 2007. Yeah. And so so you're, you're, you're working temp jobs, and, and what, what is the... Are you playing in, you have like a practice place and you're playing in bands or you're getting more interested in, I, I, I don't know how, I mean, from, for, for who you are today, I, I don't know how you got to where you are today. Sure. From what you're telling me now, you know, I don't know what, like, what was the steps that started heading you into, you know, your start, your band is playing and now that you're like, oh, this deal sucks at this club, so I'm going to start my own party. Yeah, we're, we're pretty far off from there. Um, but I, like when I was in, when I lived, when I was in high school or middle school in North Carolina, we would, uh, there was this, uh, place was called the Southwest Community Center. Okay. And it was probably, it was just like an empty sort of venue for, uh, like to have like a wedding or a family reunion or a birthday party. And you could rent it for the night for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, so all we had to do was find somebody that was, uh, 18 years old and, uh, they would rent it for us and we would have like a little punk or a metal show or whatever. And we would charge like three bucks to get in. And, uh, then we would sell just like sodas for like 75 cents or something. And I was like really into like sort of the entrepreneurial uh, aspects of that as well as like playing in bands. I was into the like promoter thing we would do like hand pass out hand bills at the mall and shit (laughs) so you so yeah so you skipped we i'm glad you went back to that Mm -hmm. um um and this this is also north carolina Mm -hmm. so um community center (laughs) rock band so you're that that's that started your promoter community you know like bringing people in together as a party you think it started started there at this community center and what you know what were these shows like it was always it was always like punk and metal bands like all ages style like yeah weird carpet, punk, on, carpet metal on the floor. like bad new metal uh you know sometimes hip-hop but just like anything you know like people were like so excited to like come to this space with no parents and you just fucking jump all over the place and Maybe there's like a little fist fight, or you, you know, some people like make out or whatever. Were there were there security guards or anything? No, like definitely not. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. You can yeah. you can hear the singer that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, he, I he's just heard it, Yeah. We're gonna have to ask him his name and get his uh, SoundCloud. Yeah, maybe you should have him on the show. 
Yeah. Okay. So, but so, uh, did this continue on into your college career? You you still yeah. were promoting shows then, or? or yeah. Yeah. So then, it, when I was in college, there was sort of this like weird dichotomy in uh, the town I lived in, Wilmington, North Carolina, where you had like the uh, indie rock, like sort of record store, CD store guys. And then you had, uh, which to me, I was never into indie rock. It just felt like sort of like wussy and like stuffy or whatever, you know. And they always, and those kids always made me feel like a redneck because I, the town I was from, we were like in the metal and we were like, you know, I guess dumber than most of them, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, and then the other uh, sort of dominant scene in the town was more of like a sort of like a senior frogs like college vibe you know where you, you know people would go out and they would like dance to Ludacris and like uh you know Pete Pablo and shit and whatever and it was that in retrospect i you know that it sounds like a, a lot of fun but because of how they like dressed and how these how like everybody acted at the time you know uh they just felt like like normies or whatever there was no element of like subculture or whatever but i'd always enjoyed dancing and like i wanted to be involved with something that was like fun socializing yeah so we me and a couple friends started which was um it was essentially just like an 80s 90s dance party where uh you know uh people would play like fucking prince and you know janet jackson and stuff like that like freestyle music and like some like electro but it was all like you know pet shop boys and shit but it was like okay if, at, at that time that was like the f you know that was like right around the time like we were learning about like what a hipster mm -hmm. was because before then there was just like no concept yeah. of that and then you have some like you know like kids that are like oh you know this is like right before like the rapture and shit so this is two, this is 99 or 2000 yeah no no this is no this is a little no this is probably like 2002 okay it, actually all this stuff may have happened but it takes a long time to get to the swamps in north carolina <laughs> so it was right before we sort of okay. learned what that stuff was and those parties uh we would like pack them out and they were a lot of fun and like you know like it was you know like hipsters were like sort of dancing and dressing sexy and it it was you know it was fun it was, fun. Yeah, it was people, a good time it was pretty carefree times at that point no one really cared w who you were or what you know mm -hmm. where you came from it was or even what you liked it was whatever i mean indie rockers had always had the yeah arms crossed thing but totally. they, s they started loosening up once they were drunk you know totally but uh so and you brought that sense of community or that you know that uh entrepreneurial tr i don't know how to say that word but entrepreneurial ship yeah that's right yeah. with you to new york city a and you immediately started throwing parties here too or uh sort of well i i would dj on i would i was a really bad dj but when i got here the thing that was happening that was really big was uh mashups uh, yeah yeah <laughs> mashups totally <laughs> I forgot <laughs> about mashups. Holy shit! I'm always talking about this stuff. I'm always like, people are like so ashamed that they that, that they even know what this stuff is. No, it's like so don't, I, don't. I haven't heard anybody who's brave enough to say the word mashup. No, but the, the one I remember that was really like the first one that hit was the the Whitney Houston and Kraftwerk one. Do you remember that one? I don't know. That's it sounds kind of cool. Oh, but that was the I one like that I remember was like, and then then after that it was just like flood wave. Well, people yeah. would mix, but then this was the first one I like saw like on a record. Sorry. Uh, so that was a little side. No, I mean that that really uh, sets the scene for uh, when my ship pulled into New York City. <laughs> Mashups are like popping off, and Philadelphia is really cool. Philly is cool. Yeah, everybody's you know like everybody's doing like uh, there was like a mix of like uh, sparks, <laughs> sparks. Yeah, yeah, like uh, that track Gypsy Woman, but to like a Baltimore beat or mm. whatever. That was like fire people like yeah i mean you I, know I, I, cardiac I mean, arrest over that shit but it, I, w I i i really appreciate that time because it was like a, you know it cross genre like even the electro yeah. clash thing which was slightly before that it was cool because you could you know I, when was the last time you like went to a club and you heard like a rock song or even like totally. a real hip-hop song that that's not just some 
whatever flavor of the month thing. Um, I don't know. It was nice that it was kind of like mixed and yeah. no one, ga- no one cared, you know, um, something happened. I don't know what happened, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like I could talk about, about this, uh, concept that you're referring to right now. I can at depth because I also is like as bad as the clothing was in some of the music. Yeah. It was like so much, uh, more exciting because everything wasn't what I, I don't know if the word what the word is like it, it was more like free form you know like you would go out and like th- this is like uh, 12 years ago in Williamsburg or something you would go to like a big house party or a loft party and there'd be like a, a hip-hop group from like the Bronx playing yeah. and then somebody playing like northern soul like some jingly jangly like white guy with like a Prince Arthur haircut <laughs> And then somebody would play like, uh, you know, like really bad, like, you know, like uh, Electro House and Metal. And it was all at one thing. And it was just like a clash of yeah. everybody at once. And everybody got along. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I liked it. I missed that a little bit too, but I don't know what, I don't know. Yeah. I, w- I think this will just like lead us down to like, well, if we start talking about this, we're going to be like, yeah. Uh, so oh, man. you want me to go back but to the story? No, 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 no. But I was so uh, one thing that I was I was going to ask is that do you think that that had to do with your age, or that that's just that was the time? Like, is that just like everyone in their life when they're about twenty three or twenty four is free, and we're older now, and we don't have that, and maybe that's still going on, or or mm, no, I I don't think it's going on as much in New York anymore. Yeah. Um, I still, on occasion, I'll end up at a place like that, and I like it. Yeah. But even young people, I know, like you know, like I know, like young people that like will only listen to like uh, you know, like German hard techno or whatever. Oh, that's terrible. And uh, yeah, or you know, just like you know, any number of genre, it's like hyper uh, segregated in a sense now and like all like you know you've probably seen there's like a lot of new venues opening and i think it makes sense from a business perspective to really have like your niche thing but at the same time when you go to a a place and everyone is dressed exactly the same and everybody's dancing exactly the same and and also so weird but you think that's good business wise because you know this stuff is is also hyper trendy so what happens when that's cool not cool anymore they have to shut for three months and remodel and change the name. Mm. Uh, well, I, I do think that, like, for example, for example, I'm like uh, preaching about how much, uh, you know, I, I'm into the, the cross genre stuff. And I am, you know, yeah. I, I really am. Um, but my club uh, or my bar, it's like a, a, a mm-hmm. club themed bar, Bossa Nova Civic Club. I don't know if we've no, we haven't mentioned that, that we haven't yet. Gotten there yet. S- uh, we started, when we started, we were kind of like, because this was seven years ago, and there there wasn't like no. a uh, a techno or a house bar at the time, really. Yeah. Right? Was there? Uh, mm. there 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 had been in yeah. the past, but at that moment there was no like real yeah. central place to go. So the idea, you know, people that were like a little older and wiser than me, and also my own intuition and my own friend group were telling me like, you know, there's not enough interest in this stuff to keep to to do dance music seven nights a week so you know maybe you can do uh you know uh, a house party or a disco techno yeah. party a few nights a week but you're gonna have to diversify and what we assumed we assumed most of the time we were going to be like every other you know sort of divey bar in williamsburg and yeah. Bushwick at the time when they were doing like, you know, like sort of 90s R&B. Bar- bartender puts their iPod on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, be like, uh, you know, you play like, uh, you know, That Girl is Poison. And then you play like a Yay Sayer song or whatever, stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, we figured we would end up for the most part doing that. And then on the weekends be able to do something that's like a little more accessible uh, yet house techno uh thing and and what we found is that we people were coming to us just for this one thing which is house and techno and anytime that we broke from that people like we lost our like base crowd now that being said i think that my bar 
the spectrum of music within dance we play is a little uh, broader than what a lot of the new places are opening up. They do something like hyper specific. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't leave my Probably house. Probably better off. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so you mentioned Bossa Nova. I don't know. Uh, uh, that was nine years ago, which means 2010. Seven so years ago. Oh, s- 2000. Okay, 2012. 2012. Yeah. Um, what how what led you to that point? There was like a couple other steps along the way yeah, that, that, sure. that that I remember. Feel free to drink as much as you want. Cool. Uh, Thank there's you. more bottles in the. Excellent. <laughs> you don't have to wait for me. Sure. Uh, so he's very polite, you guys. <laughs> so I moved here and uh, I was like, you know, for to to make friends and to have fun. I DJed. Uh, and at this point, you're DJing on a. a uh, with records or CDs? I, I would do records and I would do Burn uh, CDs. Tractor. Tractor. No, th- like I don't remember anybody playing with CDJs when I moved here. Everybody did Tractor. No, they, they had those weird like a, uh, you know, the like ones with the trays that came out and then they had like the knobs. Yeah, but uh, you don't remember that? They no, I mean I remember. Nobody seeing ever them. used them. I guess. Yeah, th- yeah. Th- that was yeah. No one I knew used them. But were, were you almost everybody's doing Serato and were shit? Were you here and for the whole like a uh, 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 lit uh, happy ending? Yeah, yeah, I would DJ at that, happy ending. Okay, yeah. that whole time because they had those things there. But really? No, no, but yeah, they had them. Yeah, I can't even remember them. So it's you're kind of pl- hazy. So honestly. you brought your computer to the party? Yeah, yeah, MacBook Pro or whatever. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah, it was it was whack. And and honestly, I. What were your big tracks? Oh man. Do you have like some panty I, droppers? I can't even remember honestly. <laughs> I would try to be come like on, I on, would yeah. try to be. Uh, wh- I ca- I can't even remember that. Y- I know you know the song "All Night Passion." Do you yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, uh, who was her? Uh, what was her name again? Alicia. So I was sort of everybody's doing electro house, and I was doing that too. But I was like, okay, I want right. to do more of sort of like the freestyle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I would play like Cybotron. I thought that was like groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. And I would do uh, like uh, synth, like diva synth pop stuff too. Oh, cool! Like a uh, Ola Moore and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know that, but okay. uh, <laughs> it, it was nothing. It was no like uh, you know nothing heady. No nothing that I could party, really be party, proud of. Party dance jams. Yeah, like roller skate jams or whatever. You oh, know? That, like classic, classic, supersonic shit like that. Oh, that's yeah. a good one too. Nobody yes. plays that anymore. Yeah, totally. You used to hear it every. There's a, there was like all these songs like that would be one of them, and that you would hear everywhere you would go. You go out and you'd hear like. I haven't quite. I don't. He, there's no hits. Sure. It's kind of weird. Are there hits now? Not. Like not there's like, like a there song you hear be. like every night, like maybe even twice or three times, or like oh the same. At my spot, in, yeah. In my world, no. You don't ever Definitely notice. not. Now everybody's trying to be as obscure as possible. We need hits, everybody. So just. I was always a. Oh, pardon me. I was always a. Uh, I was always a hit guy. You know, like kind of like a a, a a slightly obscure. Yeah, but the song guy, yeah. you want to sing along with it, you know. Yeah, exactly. I, I like vocals. I still like vocals. Me too. Um, so you're DJing at, at uh, Happy Ending and uh, uh, around this time, um, this is, I don't know. That was a weird time. I guess everybody was just everything was kind of smooth. I guess rent was sort of high, but you kind of had an okay job. Yeah, right? you know, I, you didn't weren't too stressed. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was, was I was happy, easy. you know, it was happier times for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what, so I did a couple parties, you remember that spot Capone's? Yeah, yeah, free pizza. Yeah, w- I, we did a couple really bad parties there, and then we did... Uh, that was a phenomenon that if if you don't know, that you would buy a beer and you would get a free, oh yeah, really bad pizza. Wor- world famous, It yeah. smelled like cheese, I, di- I didn't, I wasn't really into the food at bars. yeah. Bum me out, but okay. unfortunately, I was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but everybody was. I just for some reason, me, it's cheese at a bar is kind of is disgusting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Sorry. So we did a couple <laughs> parties, and then I think the thing that like really gave me, uh, uh, sort of launched me to the to the next level of uh, of trouble or whatever is. Do you remember this spot called Boogaloo? Yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> So Boogaloo, it's it's now the building is Duff's, which is the heavy metal bar, but it used to be a spot called Boogaloo, and uh, what street was that? That was uh, under the. Is it Marcy? Under the I JMC think it's Marcy. right there. Yeah. Wait, no. Yeah, that that is Marcy. It's Marcy and Broadway. And it was like a. a I saw the fall there one time. 
Really? Yeah, super weird. When it was Boogaloo. Yeah. Wait, perform there? Yeah, they played so really? weird. Yeah. Wow. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was like a I don't even know who did it. I can't maybe like sorry. So so we did uh I had like a couple guys that I was friends with that I knew from North Carolina. That place was trouble. Oh god. Yeah, it was so bad. And I linked up with this guy Carmine and uh Eamon actually from nowadays. Okay. And uh we did this uh we did like it was supposed to be like a series of parties and we do it and the thing with boogaloo is they would stay open until like uh noon or something they had a liquor license it was a legal venue but they functioned as an after hours and they would serve or whatever so just i want to i want to just set the tone a little more is that this is this is the neighborhood this is on the definitely on the south side of williamsburg Uh Um, and this was kind of one of the places where the, the the new people like you and I mm-hmm. would would blend in with the people that have grew, grown up there. Correct. So yeah. this is you know it's an, a, a mesh it was starting a to melting happen. pot. Yeah, yeah, like people that just freaks you know, totally. and, and uh, definitely an after party place. Yeah. So w- we would start DJing maybe eleven or something, and it would be there would be like maybe ten to twenty people in the bar the entire time until four a.m. And this is when all nightlife was still in Manhattan. Yeah. So even people that lived in uh, in Brooklyn, they would go all the bars, all the clubs, whatever, anything happening was uh, was in Manhattan, uh, you know, lower Manhattan. So everybody would take the train over, take a cab from the city, from Lower East Side, and um, they would come to Boogaloo at 4 a.m. All of a sudden, there's like a line around the block. It's like yeah. crazy packed. And we're like, oh, yeah, we're killing it. You know, we're unstoppable. But it was really just because it was the only place that was open that late. <laughs> And uh, the cops raided, it and uh, they shut it down or whatever. And we, you know, to me, it felt like, yo, like I'm like, I just moved here. Like I'm setting this town on fire, you know, <laughs> with my fucking bad Electra <laughs> mashups or whatever. Uh, and, you know, the cops, uh, the cops have it out for me, whatever. But, like, but this norm- is a, this is a good thing. But don't know? normally that those I find typically in that neighborhood that uh, there's a definite re- relationship between uh you know, the, the club owners and the cops. Like, yeah. You know, it's their Absolutely. cousin or whatever. And n- not at this place, no. which we okay. learned because the cops came again and shut it down during one of our parties. Like, shut it down, shut it down, arrested the bar staff. Yeah. And, uh, like, threatened to arrest the DJs, which I thought was, like, the toughest, coolest thing at mm. the time. And then after that, um, really the first thing that I, I did that was halfway notable was uh, 285 Kent. Okay. 285 Kent was this warehouse. Uh, what, so what year is this, though? This is... 2010? This is probably... Uh, yeah, probably 2010. So something haz- hazy. Yeah, somewhere around there. And we found this. It's uh, on Kent Avenue in between South 1st and South 2nd, right by the water in Williamsburg, where all the... Uh, by the Domino Sugar Plant. Yeah, where all the, uh, you know, hell condos are and, and stuff. And there was like a weird nuclear kind of radiac yeah yeah, very close by (laughs) and um uh it's now uh the home of vice media and that's where they're headquartered but uh at the time we found this warehouse spot and uh i think the rent was only two thousand dollars but wasn't it also was it what was the name of that place death by audio death by audio was in the same building same so was glasslands which was uh death by audio was like studios and they made pedals or something yeah, they made guitar pedals, and I think they lived spaces. in there. It was at the time in Williamsburg where, like, yo, it's a poetry place and a coffee shop. Artist in residency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, like, a million things. And like Glasslands was kind of like Yoga that. slam poetry or whatever. You know? <laughs> I never went to that. Um, but the, And Glasslands was sort of a... a it was like a rock venue, rock, like an indie rock venue. Rock that venue. did uh, other stuff, too. But it, it, Glasslands was Open-minded. Cool. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we uh, were like, okay, we, you know, thought of like a good scam to get a lease out of the place, signed it, and we just started doing, uh, uh, you know, me so and... Sorry to interrupt, but are you renting from, is this a Hasidic building? Yeah, it was like a Hasidic Wonderland on top okay. and okay. stuff, yeah. There's guys that actually make uh, like video game hardware, these uh, Hasidic guys, this Hasidic family, yeah. And they make video game hardware like for... 
Yeah, for like like uh like a racket for playing like Sega. I don't play video games, but yeah, you know what either. I'm talking about. No, and like a Wii Fit controller. Yeah, yeah, or something. exactly, stuff like that. Really, wow. <laughs> really like eccentric, uh, gentlemen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we we rent this place out and we start doing parties, and at the time I was working at the uh, Trophy Bar, which was like a very small bar. It, very small with like no sound system i mean just a really small bar that serves like grilled cheese and shit but at the time it was like the most happening thing in terms of like they were trying to do the whole dj thing yes they they weren't even so much trying but it was just like happening happening there like that's where i first uh met ron morelli dame funk dj there on like a tuesday night Yeah, yeah Uh, Shannon from Light Asylum played at Trophy Bar, yeah. like performed live there. Lee Douglas yeah. on I, yeah. um, a lot of a lot of people that yeah. uh, sort of uh, were sort of like, you know, you could argue are like really the foundation of what, yeah. you know, the scene whatever, or whatever this has is. become. Yeah. yeah, we're at Trophy Bar, so I knew like you know all these people from there. And everybody's like, okay, like this DJ thing, this like dance music thing is really blowing up, but there's not like a venue for a bigger place, you yeah, know? You yeah. can only do it at a bar with like clock radio speakers. Yeah. And uh, the dance floor is only big enough for 20 people. Or you could do it at Tribeca Grand. Yeah. Yep. They're doing it at hotels as well. And like people like me who are broke, fucking yeah. redneck yeah. bums. Can't like, afford a $19 yeah, can't afford margarita. That. Yeah. And they won't let us in anyway, yeah. you know? <laughs> Oh, that's still the red velvet rope. Yeah, exactly. So we're like, oh, what if we took this unventilated uh, cement box, which was 285 Kent, and just put some shitty, like, PV speakers in there? And uh, It's a good brand. Yeah, we filled out, like, you know, you could fit, like, 300 people in there. So we did parties with, like, DJ Spun and Jacques Renault and uh, I can't even remember, you know, a bunch of people. Like, the guys from, like, Tiki Disco and shit. Stuff like that where, you know, the music was good. At the time, it was all about, like, being fun, you know, and it was mostly, like, disco and, like, some Chicago house. Little bit of acid stuff. This, but is, this is the edits edits time. Exactly, exactly. And so, like, people like Ron Morelli and Lee Douglas were mm-hmm. doing sort of, like, the, you know, mutant disco stuff. Justin yes. Vandervolgen. All that stuff was, like, really cool, but very, very different from what everybody, like, really became known for. Yeah. And that that's because that was the only thing, like, really happened. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm a proponent uh, of the theory that uh, the, the things that shape the music scenes has, like, so much to do with, uh, you know, the, what the government allows to happen, one, and also, like, what the venues give you the possibilities for. Because at the time, like, no n- no bar had subwoofers. No bar had, like, real good gear. And, like, you couldn't really play music, like, loud. You know what I mean? So people were just playing, like, oh, here's this, like, you know, weird Paul McCartney uh, yeah. edit or whatever. <laughs> or, like, a, a fucking, you know, cool Bee Gees <laughs> edit or a, a Tallow edit or whatever. And the yeah. shit was all cool. Yeah. But it's, like, that's all, you know, you couldn't, like, drop some, like, dirty fucking acid yeah. techno like you know when you don't have subwoofers at a know. grilled cheese bar what else was 2010 yeah i guess that was the free pizza bar yeah exactly free pizza bar and disco at its time exactly. maybe happy ending happy ending was still somehow going yeah it was a li- they, they were a little more like electro chic or whatever was it, what was the big i mean th- uh oh that was a uh, what was the place with the water in it uh on north sixth uh Galapagos. Yeah, Galapagos was kind of. Yeah. I don't. Was that before that or same time? Same time. Same time. And and you know the those guys uh, the bunker guys they were actually doing techno parties if my yeah. memory. Yeah, I was just tr- I was correctly. trying to think of what what was going on that time that w- w- relates to the you know the real boom boom DJ yeah. scene you know. They're, they're really the only guys I r- remember that uh, were doing like. Still real going. techno at the time that are still doing it. Yeah. it. Everybody else is like a little, you know, we're a little sh- ashamed to admit of what we were listening to at that time. But it, it was definitely different than what we're <laughs> the music that like we're producing now or whatever or overwhelmingly so. Not me. 
Yeah, maybe not you. I mean, you are you're you're a real G. You've been no, doing it for a while. No, you're no, certified authentic. Thanks, but uh, yeah, I don't need that. I got no ego problems. Sure, but uh, you, the, my my point is that like most people that come to my bar, um, and people that I think have, are are doing uh like a a very impressive job of making like mind blowing music or DJing or whatever. Like ten years ago, we were listening to like indie rock or like who knows what you know like no that's okay you know we all come from from you got to start somewhere you know yeah and i think that, you know that's a problem is that you know you shouldn't be ashamed like you're you're, you're pretty open you're like yeah I, I wore a hemp necklace and i like to jam bands and you know i don't think any less of you oh thank you you that, know what i mean it's that like means a lot. you know it's it's it shouldn't you shouldn't no one chooses wh where they're from or who they are of you course know? yeah like, I don't know when our brain finally develops, and, and then you can start judging, you know, yeah. like after 26 or something. Yeah, and I actually think that's what makes uh, the New York City uh, dance music scene so exciting uh, compared to other places, because everybody's come from this, like, weird and sort of bad background that they're super ashamed of. <laughs> so we're all having this, like, crazy identity crisis, because, like, a few years ago you were listening to, like, fucking dubstep or uh yeah. like uh <laughs> no. gri grizzly bear or something like everybody's listening to like you know when you dig up somebody's yeah, yeah. like old facebook pics <laughs> you oh, know stuff like that terrible social media is so really just I feel, I feel bad slamming for together you know with all these backgrounds and the internet is forever you taste. guys yeah that, that's just really hard for people now you know you get to see you know, you can like just look at someone's history and, and judge them very harshly now. <laughs> I feel bad. You know, it's terrible. Like no one's going to see like, the pictures of me when I'm 21 and like writing like, oh, geez. You know, I don't know what I was saying at the time. But what were you saying? I don't know. You uh, remember. Some I, uh, there's it. probably some forum forum. Uh, what were you into vaguely? What I mean, I've been in this scene, what, what, whatever's going on now since 2000 or so. To, to so you were making like Acid House since 2000. Yeah. Oh, that's Not impressive. Acid House, but whatever this weird, you know, I had an 808 and a Pro 1. Oh, really? And a, yeah. yeah. And a Mac Mac computer, you know, oh, really? and like records, like the same. And I was doing tours and parties. and. Ah, oh, that's impressive. So yeah. uh, um, I don't want to toot my own, own horn too, too much. But I mean, I, that's I'm, I'm interested in this. I have a, I, you know, I, I, I invested in it. So, Absolutely. So yeah. uh, I want to continue it and I want to learn more about it. And I want to share, you know, the information with Absolutely. people so they can do it keep going you know what i mean um so you started 285 and uh this developed some probably a lot of the relationships that you're still in now um with a lot of the yeah. artists and the, the scene is still kind of that might around that time is kind of the 2010 2012 is kind of when whatever started that's going on now is like maybe mm -hmm. like the lies kind of seen um uh, totally or i don't know even know what you wh what you call it um i mean i i referred to it and i'm sure a lot of people don't like this but sort of like bedroom techno because it was just like uh people like producing stuff in their uh bedrooms that you know often got called lo-fi which you know yeah. i don't know if you you like that or not but it was like stuff that was like essentially made to be listened to in your bedroom yeah. i mean th this is my uh DIY. my take yeah diy or whatever yeah i guess that was that was the time where you could like you could from start to finish you could completely control it you could produce it you could you know distribute it make it have the venues it was all in your control is that yeah but it, maybe it started before that but I'm, I'm sure yeah i mean everything's always evolving but when we're talking about sort of what's going on you know like the steve summers yeah. uh the the yeah the lies and i guess uh you know whatever the the, w, the birth of wt how long has that been around? oh it's older than lies oh okay i helped him do it oh, wow. i taught him everything he knows <laughs> exactly he, he, yeah. he was my roommate at the time and and uh cool he was like oh this oh well, here's <laughs> You want to hear a Morelli story? I, I love Morelli stories. Yeah, oh. of course. Well, I'm, I'm not, I've known him for a while. He kind of—I think I met him through Marcus Cabral because Mar great guy. Marcus, Both of them great. Marcus guys. used to work at Sonic Groove uh -huh, a long okay, time cool. ago with like Brennan Green, cool, and cool. Dan Physics, and uh, somehow I met Ron, whatever, somehow along the way, and uh, he was kind of on some of the same forums uh, as I was a little bit, but he was a little more hip hop and streetwear than I was. <laughs> 
I was a little more of like a skateboarder, uh, and, nice. uh, and, uh, and, uh, so I, I started doing these tours with people like with, uh, like Lego Welt and these guys, and this was 2001 mm-hmm. and, uh, I started doing these tours and for a few years and then eventually Ron decided that he wanted to do some too. So he did, I was, I, I w- Ari was here last night and he went on Ron's first tour. It was, uh, mm-hmm. it was, um, DJ Overdose and Ingmar Pauli, which is the Nova man, which is like a, um, on Vulex, which is like Before a my time. intergalactic FM. Sound yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it was Ron Morelli, Manhunter, which is uh, Jason Letkowitz and Ari Goldman. Oh, cool. And uh, Nova Man, which was two Dutch guys that were on Bunker Records from the Netherlands. Cool. And so that was the first. I I was going on these things, so I, I hooked them up and gave them all these contacts, and they drove around. and went to all the Maybe they went to like a couple other people right. that Ron knew from like his noise metal band mm-hmm. background. And then a few years after that, I m- we moved in together somehow. Yeah. Maybe 2008 or something, because I was, I was living right by Bossa Nova from 2004 to 2009. I lived on Willoughby between Central oh and Wilson. Oh, wow. We got a real OG here. And, uh, yeah, and it out. sucked. Yeah. It's still not great, huh? No, it was, it was, <laughs> I like, the first night I spent, I moved in by myself. I like, first night I was there in like 2004, I was like, what am I doing? Like, crying myself to sleep. Yeah. Like, like, wake. Uh, I still wh- cry myself to sleep. It was bleak. That. And then, uh, um. I moved in with him and, and I started the label. I, I probably released one or two records and he was like, okay, I'm going to do that too. And then he just yeah, went for it really hard, you know. But I, I, I mean, so... That's my Ron Like, thing. I'd like to hear you weigh in on my theory here. My theory was like, at the time, there wasn't a, uh, a notable active club scene. So this music was um, um, more or less made to be... Uh, it was produced and meant to be cons- or ge- overwhelmingly consumed within the home right yeah. uh, would you say that's true or i don't know well, so see cuz there was there was a whole other you know the dfa guys were around from you know the late 90s mm-hmm. through so th- i didn't know, some, I didn't some know of them some of them right. were li- left left over and still around but we were kind of traumatized by the whole uh we'll, we'll get into this later the whole uh cabaret law thing mm-hmm. like i even had like i know you know dom from plant but yeah i was djing at plant with josh from uh josh okay. Halkin from we we de- g- dj'd friday nights uh, okay on at plant bar and i was djing and and uh luke from the rapture was the bartender mm-hmm. and, oh, go- really? and like gorman from uh, chick 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 was the bar back oh wow and uh the police came in, came straight up to me. I was playing a record. Like, do you work here? And I was like, I'm just a DJ. They're like, take your stuff and go. Wow. And they, that was the night that they arrested Dom. They like shut, shut the place down. They got arrested. They were going to, they took him to jail. They were going to, uh. they were going to take Luke to jail, but Luke called and it was like the owner comes and Holy Dom shit. shut the padlock. The so, so we were, we were traumatized. We had, you know, uh, we kept trying to do it. So we ended up being that our, our safe place was these fashion parties. We would do fashion stuff. We would work with vice. Mm-hmm. Like Sarush was my neighbor. Like Sarush oh, yeah. moved into New York. We moved into the same building, like in the same year. He was like lived across the hallway, and so we would just go over there and like hang out with him. And he was fascinated by me because I was from Texas. He was like, <laughs> I've never met someone from Texas that's like somewhat normal. So um, this this we were traumatized. Like we had this like sure. so so we went into this like fashion. Like fashion never seemed to be attacked by the police. Of course, yeah. for some uh, whatever reason that was. Um, and then we would also, you know, like the gay gay parties were a lot more mixed. It mm-hmm. wasn't so separate. So so we would do this fashion and gay scene, and we kind of just hid in that somehow. And then I don't know what happened. I, I'm not sure. It, it definitely changed into what you're saying now, which is this like bedroom thing. But but I think what happened was technology. Is that it was it became available to a person with not a lot of money that they could have a home studio. Sure. So uh, that might, to me, that's more where it comes from. Like, I, I, I'm not quite sure what, where I'm headed, but, uh, uh, but, but also your, I think your roots run a little deeper than most people that were, uh, yeah. um, th- than a lot of the other pioneers of the scene, because you're one of the few people, uh, that, I think I could say that had something uh, to do with uh, the the quote unquote lo-fi techno movement that actually you know also was DJing in clubs. Yeah. Right. Because most of the people 
that uh, the biggest names, uh, you know, on Lies Records and I- I'm sure on your label too and a lot of stuff. Uh, well, I mean, Doug Doug was a disco guy. Doug yeah. was like, you know, and in, in he was like wearing, not wearing bell bottoms, but pretty close. He was wearing like sandals all the time, you know, and like long hair. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's a... Uh, but was he was he like he wasn't he was, like DJing the no, loft? I mean, he wasn't DJing. Yeah, like, no. He, was he DJing big disco parties? I remember at yeah, Trophy Bar. No, but he. I mean, he like had fucking uh, rotary mixers and was into sure, Dave yeah. Mancuso and you know, it went pretty pretty. They were pretty deep into it for a long time. Like I, I think probably even from high school, like in the nineties in, in San Francisco, or not San Francisco in Los Angeles, because he, him. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Doug Lee. And Andrew uh, Lovefingers went to high school together. I didn't know that in Los no. Angeles. So uh, there's, I mean, there's, you get further back into it. It's pretty, it's pretty deep, you know. Like, uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, our our links seem to be from these like early social social media things with, that were like uh, forums. I mean, this is before discogs and stuff. It was sure. just like you post on a forum, like talking about your Italo records or your sure, yeah. 808 or whatever. I don't. I. I. am not sure. There's not like a moment where it all happened. And then, the, but there's also a whole scene before that too. There's like the whole like '90s, like John Selway, like mm. techno Moby, you know, yeah. and, and uh, Frankie Bones and Adam X. The whole like Sonic Groove thing. Um, there, it's been here. You know, it's just kind of what you're aware of, I guess. You know, like the further you deep you dive into it, you realize that you know it's just people. They've been people always want to hang out with their friends and party and, and boom, yeah. boom, boom. And I don't, I, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this is to find out sure. more about it. Well, I didn't realize that your connect. I, I didn't realize you were actually connected to like club stuff Yeah. that, that deep. Yeah. No, uh, I, my thing was when I first moved here, I moved here in 99, which is not, I mean, whatever, it's been 20 years now. And, uh, uh-huh. my thing was that, uh, I, I think one of my first gigs, it was like, uh, my roommate worked at Wilhelmina. Oh, he was like my best friend. I was in a band with him, and uh, mm. he worked at Wilhelmina Modeling Agency. And he was a real, like, a charming guy. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he was the guy. He would walk into a room, and he was like the center of attention. And uh, he would, uh, uh, he could command the room, like no matter where he went. So he, he just went around, like whatever, like met everybody, like yeah. within the first two days of living in New York City, you know. And then like, I, he would just. All of a sudden, I was a DJ because I had a lot of records. So he's like, oh, my my friend has records. He can DJ. Cool. I had no idea. So I'd just show up at the, like, you know, New York Fashion Week film whatever party. And, like, he would get me these gigs. And so I just started playing. I had sure, no yeah. idea. It didn't come from that background at all. I just had a lot of records. And that was the thing is, like, that was that was the DJ at that point. It was like. This is, you said 2000? No, 1999 or so. 99. To, to okay. 2000. Yeah. And I, I had no idea. I was. 23 years old or 22 or something i didn't i was just like oh models are cool <laughs> you know, sure whatever well I, I i mean i wasn't part of the like i i think i i think both of our uh theories here can maybe coexist no they do for sure but what i was seeing is at the time that this music this stuff was like really starting to take off at least is yeah. that there was no venue that at least i was aware of for people to to perform there, out at no um Th- i mean we were doing everything at, we would do it at tribeca grand yeah tommy soleil would help us and jo- that was with josh from uh who does good room now. yeah yeah who i went to high school with in san antonio cool and uh he he, w- he was doing stuff and there was not really you're right there was not really a i mean th- you had like a cielo sure and apt apt was yeah, kind of yeah but were people getting booked at no yeah you APT, go see yeah. theo Parrish there yeah exactly you know, yeah. um or I don't know uh, Maurice Fulton or you know you would it was more uh, I saw Africa Africa Mombada yeah, had a residency it was like house Ellen house you yeah. know it was like a real it was kind of that was a continuation of the eighties culture like it it, totally. re- it went through to the nineties and eighties and they were still it w- that was a uh, Justin Carter and Saida Saida was a booker I don't know if you know okay. her no but I think she works for so- Sonos or something now she has like cool. a real job um, sorry all right let's let's uh let's go back to John Barclay here <laughs> with us on talk video um we, we had some uh it was a good it was a distractions great, great detour it was very enlightening sorry um illuminating uh, um for me so uh you go back 285 kent so 
most people know. So like John Barclay, the first thing they think, okay, uh, Bossa Nova. And uh, so how did Bossa Nova start from 285 Kent? Or d- were they related at all? Or you were? Yeah, f- uh, f- for sure. So we did 285 Kent. And at the time, the thing that we were like sort of making our money off of, I, I mean, we didn't make it. I still haven't made money. <laughs> but the, the thing that was bringing people out was uh, sort of uh, the fact that there was a lot of movement in this uh, sort of hotel lobby DJ, uh, yeah. um, like uh, Let's Play House, that record label, Jacques Renault and his crew. Yeah. Um, and a lot of other people that were Mark Verbos, for example, who's like an OG Midwest. Uh, techno hardware guy he was playing like poppy disco and stuff at the time because y- when you play out you want to play in front of people and so that was where the real movement in the scene that i was seeing was so we started doing that stuff um a lot of the music i really liked but sort of the stuff that i was really more into at the time was more uh along the lines of the, like the stuff that you were putting out you know lego welt type stuff yeah, yeah. And then around the same time, you have uh, Aurora Halal was doing uh, the mutual, mutual dream. dreaming parties. And to me, that was like, okay, wow, this is like yeah, avant-garde she, enough for me, and it's danceable. And she d- knew how to throw a party. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And she still does. She's still still amazing, yeah. And so we started doing parties like that. We were making uh, you know, even less money, but... Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, You're starting to, to to develop the scene that you're still a part of now. Yes, this was the start of it. Exactly. And uh, what uh, at the, I don't know, the first time I started hearing, I didn't. I knew 285 Kent, but I didn't really know who did it. Sure. I just yeah. uh, and then uh, there was also at the same time there was this trip house thing, or was that? Yeah, trip house was after. That was so after. we did 285 Kent for like s- six months, seven months, and we got raided by the police. And a few of us got arrested, <laughs> which was... Did you have to go to jail? I went to jail, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. What would um, your mother say? She didn't find out until much later, and I forget so. what she said. You know, I think she thought it was like kind of cool, <laughs> you know? Like <laughs> She's like, I know. I know you went to jail. You think we don't know things, but we know things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is like spend the night? Or yeah, it was like nights. 23 hours. Yeah, it was yeah. so stupid. You can stay awake for that, so it's not... Yeah, and um, after that, uh, my my partner there, he was like a little older and a little more professional than me, and he was like, I think we should back out of this because we just assumed the cops are going to come right back and arrest us yeah, again yeah, if we try to have another yeah, party. Of course. And so we uh, transferred the lease to Todd P., who's like a, a you know, pretty famous DIY guy, runs Market Hotel, uh, he, Trans Picos. Indie rocker. Uh, yeah, traditionally, historically indie rock, but, uh, you know, he dabbles all over the place. He's a, he's like a, he's a venue guy. <laughs> I, don't you know? Know, I don't know him. He's like a back-of-house guy, but he, he really made a name for himself in, like, the, the, the rock and roll he, world. He has experience with these DIY uh Absolutely. Yeah. So he took over and that's when he went like 50 times harder than us. We would do once, maybe twice a week. He was doing like five nights a week. Huge shows. Uh, like uh, you know, Animal Collective. Yeah, it'd be like Animal Collective with like ASAP Rocky and shit like that. Just really over the top and the place became like super, you know, scene famous or whatever. And then I would be like, oh, yeah, you know who founded that? That was me. Yeah, I got arrested. You know, shit like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the golden era of uh, 285 Kent was Todd P. Uh, with, a, with a, couple of his, uh, a couple of his guys. Um, but we would go back, and uh, we had an agreement where we would throw a party once a month. And it was at that point that we started to see, like, the— uh, like, experimental hipsters or whatever you want to call them, more like the art school kids start to like mesh with uh you know what at the time was like the disco type people mm-hmm. and uh that's like around the same time that the uh, lies started to take off 
that uh, I think that your record label started and to take there, off. There, there was also a, another scene that doesn't always get mentioned is like the weird, weird records. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. New Wave guys absolutely. also kind of blended in a little bit. Oh, yeah, too. for sure. And and they were great. And, uh, you know, but I don't know. I don't know those guys. Yeah. Uh, but I, I remember going to their parties and thinking, wow, this is amazing. And I, I, I wish I, it would have stuck to, around. Right? give you some story, But they're, they're, they know what they're doing. I, okay, I, can, I, can yeah, I, I buy that. I could give you some background on that too. I, I, I saw that happen too. Sure, yeah. There's a there, there's original guy that doesn't get mentioned very often. His name is uh, Gilles, but I call him Giles because I'm, okay. I'm from Texas. And French? He, yeah, what is Gilles it? Gilles New Wave, yeah. and he was a he he started DJing. I would the first time I ever saw him, he would play at uh at Enid's. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and like above the bar. R.I.P. And, and yeah. yeah, it was like ninety nine, two thousand. It was, and he would only play music between seventy nine and eighty three. And he so he had this like thing and a kind of Dan Selzer somehow was around a little bit oh, too. Oh really? And so Gilles okay. would play these new wave and then he did this party called Decadance, and uh, okay, and Veronica kind of came around and and Sean from Marshall Cantrell was in a band called More More Vagine. After there's a I think there's a novel called that. Cool. And he would play and then Peter came in Peter Schoolworth, and then they started uh, at Southside Lounge. They started the Weird Party, and it was a. Uh, it was pretty freaky. Like, I mean, you know, uh, one of the, the stories, I won't say who did it, but one of one of our f- local friends, like, ended up, like, giving a blind Hasidic guy a blowjob in the bathroom. Oh, cool. Like, just really, you know, like, it was a pretty open-minded place, you know? <laughs> and uh, and then somehow uh, it moved from Southside Lounge, which was as its, its original home, and, and then it went to Home Sweet Home. And uh, then Peter and Glenn, uh, I can't remember Glenn's last name, um, they started doing their like death rock and what you know new wave parties and yeah. that, that became a real scene and they they did a good job um so maybe i could get him on the pod peter you, you yeah i mean i think he's still around yeah nobody really talks about weird anymore but i think they should I, they, they, yeah exactly sorry i, g- I keep getting distracted you gotta no i, I give, like give it. some yeah, credit I where credit's due yeah absolutely absolutely because he, he knew he he knew the thing that i really liked about uh, uh, those parties is that he knew like when it was like getting cool, that he totally. would, he would like start just he would just play like death rock only. He like knew people were coming there to hear like ceramic hello or whatever cool new wave band they like, and then he would just play like you know like goth rock, and like everybody would get bummed out and just leave. Yeah, and it was and it's kind of the same thing that like Detlef from Salon de Amateurs would do the same thing, like in Dusseldorf they had the whole art rock scene, and like whenever it would start getting really coward, he'd just start playing like music concrete like super loud and just scare everybody out of the bar. Mm-hmm. It, it somehow it it made the scene stronger and cooler, <laughs> um, but I don't know. We don't. We need that. More, you know, when people like just put on a noise rock record and like clear the clear the floor, we need more of that. I don't. I keep getting distracted. Too much wine. I don't know. So maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you have a, a little more. I guess. Yeah, we'll sure. Finish it off. Um. So so n- now you decide I'm gonna open a club. No, not yet. No. So you do trip house. Yeah. So trip house is the next thing. This uh, um, <laughs> very uh, cool, uh, eccentric, Hasidic, uh, like, um, what do you call him? Like a, I guess he's like a real, he's a landlord, but he owns a lot. Is there like a good name a for that? A real estate mogul. Yeah, he's a, he's a, like a real estate mogul. Uh, land, he, landowner. Yeah, he purchased this, uh, I think it was a 21-bedroom... Victorian flop, flop mansion in uh, Bushwick. in Bushwick, and it w- it was just a single unit. There's a lot. If you go down Bushwick Avenue, there's a ton of these mansions. Yeah, there's a, there's another one I went into one time that one of the guys from Other Music owns a house. I don't know if he still does, but right there, pretty close to where Trip House was. Uh, yeah, right across the street, and it was like cool, like three bedroom house with a separate garage. Like, oh, or not nice. three bedroom, but three story house. Uh, Maybe with like is it like white and black? Is that the one you I don't know what there was one that, that would do parties. No, they didn't do parties. Oh, he okay. just lived there. He was like one of the But Yeah, so th- there used to be a lot of like really wealthy uh Germans in Bushwick way back in the day. And, and you know who also lives on that you know that uh was it Doctor York? You should look Oh yeah, yeah, the new Wabi. I live yeah. right there. Okay, so yeah, yeah of course. That, that's right down the street too, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> Those of you who don't what's it called? New Wabian? Nuwabians. Yeah, so anybody that doesn't know about Nuwabians should, should look them up. They're down the street, and you're renting from Hasidic guys yeah. on Bushwick Ave. They don't own? You don't think they own that? 
No, 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 no. I'm saying you're renting from Bushwick oh, yes. Ave, but the okay. New Wabians definitely own that place. Yes, yes, they own that block easily. Yeah. Okay, so, so th- <laughs> this uh, Hasidic uh, real estate mogul. What was his? Are you, can you tell me? Yeah, the I don't want to say his, his name because we got him name? in trouble. Uh, we got him in trouble. No, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> well, we'll say his name is uh, Moishi. Jim Moishi or Moishi. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> He uh, he 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 purchases this place at a really good rate, unfortunately, and uh, he doesn't. It, the place is in really really bad shape. It's for the most essentially just like a really old couple had been living there by themselves. Th- this is my understanding of the story, and what what I witnessed is they lived there by themselves for a very long time. And they decided that they uh, uh, wanted to move to, like, the Caribbean or something. And they sold it to him for way cheaper than what they should have. And he gets this spot, and it would probably cost more to repair the spot than what he paid for it uh, total. And he's like, I don't really know what I want to do with it yet. But because it's, uh, you know, the DOB, uh, Department of Buildings and all the, um, you know, bureaucracy to to make any changes is ex- extremely difficult it yeah. takes a lot of time what, um, is it like a historical landmark or something? no no it's not but like everything in the place had to be redone and you got to pull permits for that yeah. and it could take you know seven months before you get and, it approved and it's not like you can do illegal construction because it's like right on the main street well now you can and people do right. constantly but he didn't want to for whatever reason and he's like, I got to figure out what I'm going to do with this. Um, I'm not going to do anything with it for, you know, six months or so. But in the meantime, I'd like to do something neat with it. And, uh, you know, I know you throw these like uh, parties, all these people come up and there's entertainment. Did he, did he go to the parties? Yeah. Yeah. He'd been to one or two. And he's like, yeah, what if we just threw like an event here, you know? And I'm like, yeah, sure. We can try it. I'm like, you know, I don't. You know, anybody I do business with, I'm like, I'll be honest with them. Like, obviously, I want, I'm like, yeah, of course, I want to throw, like, this, like, crazy, like, hell on earth party in a a 21-story mansion. But at the same time, like, I don't recommend this to you. Yeah, there's a lot of of, of crevices and corners where stuff could happen. Yeah, exactly, and liability-wise. And then on top of that, the money is is never anywhere what you think it's going to be. And he's like, I don't care. Like, I just want to have some fun. And this is a guy who's just, like, really, you know, he makes a lot of money doing, like, boring real estate development. And he just wants to have, like, a little fun. He doesn't, you know. Is this, is this like, a family man or? Uh, you know, I, I don't think he has a family, but he's huh. he's old enough to have a family. He's not creepy. He's not hitting on the women. He's yeah. not, uh, he doesn't uh, drink or do drugs. So he's a he tr- just. He likes to see people have a good time, and he's interested in music. A and true patron. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, nice. So we do uh, we do a few of these parties, and it's like, you know, we don't have a budget to do, like, what we should do. So we just, again, throw a bunch of, like, plastic PV speakers, and then we tell all these, like, sort of, like, net artists and stuff, like, hey, uh, you know, open call. We've got this, like, 21-bedroom, uh, you know, mansion. So people like, hey, I'd like to, you know, like, you spray know, paint paste, the windows. Yeah, exactly. Spray paint the windows and the, like do my like uh, you know like uh, you know slam poetry like when I'm on a headstand thing in this one room, and in the other room there's like mimes or whatever, and it's just like okay, like nobody's really getting paid, or maybe we'll pay you like fifty bucks or whatever, but you can do whatever you want in the room and yeah. have fun. And then we we did like three rooms that had like entertainment. And uh, it was absolutely bananas, and it was also so terrifying and so stupid to do. Yeah, uh, there's no no way you would ever do that ever again. Oh, absolutely not. It was it was so terrifying, and you know, <laughs> you just have people. I guess you didn't have insurance. I yeah, I, I would rather not discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it it, w- it wasn't safe anyway, you know. You cut it, but it was a lot of fun, and then, you know, we got in some trouble with the press, and we essentially, like, got kicked out of the place on, on good terms. Yeah. And then from that, at that point, it was like, okay, I did 285 Kent. I did this place Trip House. 
um, you know, which w w honestly was more about sort of the uh, the venues and less or my my luck, you know, and then less about what I was bringing to the table. But at that point, everybody was like, but you, oh, who is this bum? You know, and but you 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 facilitated it. I don't sure. think I don't think you probably didn't realize it, but it just you made it happen. Uh, I don't know. There's something to say for that. Maybe you didn't. It's not quite curation at this point. Sure. Or I don't know. Maybe you d I don't. I didn't know you, so I don't know what your uh, idea was behind that. Um, so, uh, w and then you just when you decide to start Bossa Nova, is it's just you, or you had some uh, some sort of Well, this guy I know is uh, his um, mother bought the building. Oh, okay. And he's like, "Do you know anybody that uh, would?" Um, there used to be, uh, and, and how did you meet this guy? Is it just through, just like ran, he was, a, his mother was into real estate and I met him when I worked at trophy bar. Okay. A neighborhood guy. Yeah. And he's like, my mother bought this building. Um, and there used to be, uh, there's like an abandoned bar, uh, on the ground floor. He's like, do you know anybody, you know, because he knew I worked yeah. in nightlife or whatever. Yeah. Do you know anybody who would be interested in uh, renting it out? And I was like, yeah, let me take a look. I can ask some people. And we went and we checked it out. And it was, honestly, it was, like, so gorgeous yeah. what used to be in there. They had these, like, beautiful black or, like, uh, slate tiles up to, like, probably, you know, waist length or something. And it was all mirrored, like, the whole place. And uh, it was, like, the most gorgeous bar it kind of looked like you know like if like um uh like gloria stefan you know like uh, you know like she would hang out there before she hit it big you know it was like and there's all these like urban legends about what used to happen there from like guys in the neighborhood but apparently there's like gambling and like you know organized crime and bullshit i don't know if any yeah, of that's yeah, true yeah, yeah, but it definitely looked like really cool and sort of you know so it, it was dark pre pretty finished already it, it was very finished Unfortunately, we weren't able to keep all the character or yeah. basically none. So that's where the idea of like, oh, this tropical bar is coming from. It used to be called uh, La Mayimba and then it was uh, Salon de Marlin or something. And it was uh, La Mayimba. Yeah. And Salon de Marlin. But it, it was it was gorgeous. It was it wasn't called Bossa Nova. No, Bossa. no. So we had to. So I, I see this place. I'm like, yo, this place is incredible. The rent is super cheap. Uh, your your mother will like hook us up, yeah, or whatever. And uh, and um, this guy has, uh, you know, his mother is willing to put a little bit of money into it. And so I'm like, you know, if we can find some more money, of course we thought we could do it way cheaper than what we ended up yeah. being. But it's only, able to do it's it. It's only money. Yeah. <laughs> and so then we find another guy that has a little more money, and. Uh, he's willing to invest in it and so we open it up we uh, m the, my plan was originally to keep uh the the overall uh aesthetic to keep as many of the details but as possible in so retrospect it seems like kind of like a whack kind of hipstery thing to do sorry to interrupt but uh, no problem just a, a question that i have personally is that uh like when you're working with an investor does it do they have uh, uh they put in their two cents quite a bit or, or they're pretty they they trust you or, or luckily they were uh dealing with like uh projects that were like a lot uh so this is bigger than this okay so i was able to uh i would say control control let's say 95 percent so of it's what pretty happened. much your 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 yeah child absolutely yeah that's okay Thank and thanks for doing it uh um, thank you and, and so in the beginning i i remember two also, there was a little backyard, and, and that was oh pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. great. R.I.P. R -I -P, the backyard. Yeah. Um, but everybody would just hang out back there, though. Nobody would even go inside. Yeah, nobody would go. So but yeah. now they're out front, so I don't know if that's better. Like Same shit. Yeah, it's worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what used to happen is we, we would open at 5, and we'd have like a nice little backyard with bleachers, and everybody would sit back there and smoke weed and drink. And then nobody would be inside there'd be like 60 people outside yeah. until we closed the backyard at midnight and then everybody then all of a sudden the bar is packed yeah. so the opening dj uh you know there would maybe be one or two people that watched them which was um, is there any, ch tragic. any chance for the backyard ever 
Um, it's it's possible, but it's unlikely. You're over it. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of work, they essentially have to reopen your case and all this shit. It's you don't want to bring the... Yeah, you, you just don't want to deal yeah. with the authorities yeah. under pretty much any circumstances in New York. So what this is 2012, 12. Yeah. Bossa Nova opens, and, and people went there. It, was, it, it started a thing, you know, people, uh, I don't know what happened, but everybody would go there for a while. Sure, yeah. Everybody kind of lived over in that area, and uh, it was cheap, and you kind of knew the bartender. Maybe you get a free drink or two. And, uh, unfortunately, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it helps, you know. It, it, uh, it maybe it's not the best business decision a short term, but maybe long term. Sure, yeah. People, you know, it's like a... Yeah, I mean, I, r- I recognize the, the benefit of the buyback or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> That's what you call it as a bartender. <laughs> um, but uh, it, w- it, it became a thing... Um, I don't know, and it's still a thing today. Uh, is there, is there, was there some? It really hasn't changed that much. Um, it's still kind of the same. Like a whoever the new, you kind of let whoever is seems like a serious person, a, a promoter, DJ, whatever you want to call them, party mm-hmm. thrower. That if they're serious, you kind of let them come in and try it. It seems like, sure. and if it goes well, you let them come back regularly and 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 there's some people that are there from the beginning and then you also have some new people um, sure yeah uh along the way you also had uh, some troubles yeah um, um so the first you a know lot of the, 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 the first you still know, have a lot of trouble. first couple of things you know you had to close the backyard that was kind of the first thing i remember sure was there other stuff Both well stuff? i mean uh, so what happened is uh we first off like Anything in New York City nightlife, every venue is like so illegal. There's so many regulations. Yeah. Um, so any bar, even you go into a bar and it feels so clean and run by yuppies or whatever or corporate, you're breaking laws in New York City. Um, it's designed that way. So if they don't like you for whatever yeah. reason, th- they have uh, you know thousands of regulations at their disposal that they can use to uh, shut you down. Most of the time, they don't. But if if you're doing something that they don't like yeah. for a number of reasons, let's say you're just really loud, or you're, uh, you know, selling drugs or sex out of your venue, or there's a lot of fights or a lot of crime, yeah. or you're, uh, you know, you're a gay bar in a conservative neighborhood, or a well, hip hop bar in if, a white. If somebody neighborhood. wants to shut a business down in New York City, they can. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't matter what if you, you know, if you're a shitty person and you don't like a business, you could get it shut down. A thousand percent. It's pretty, it's pretty scary. Like it, it's a, uh, uh, and I, 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 it's surprising to me that people can pull through, you know? Yeah. And, and you've made it past all these hurdles, you know? Yeah. And I mean, we've been extremely lucky, you know, we've worked really hard on it too, but yeah. a lot of people that were more skilled and harder workers and smarter than us have not been as lucky and yeah. uh you know uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll, you'll be all right i think yeah we'll, uh, we'll see but yeah, so we'll uh, um you know you had a, a couple things along and uh, so let's we're gonna uh, it's we've already been an hour and a half in oh really in case well, you have sure. somewhere to go i don't know well. but uh so we can get to a, a few more things before you uh i don't know if you have a date or anything but no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's monday uh, um so um you one thing that I guess we should talk about that people probably feel like is that somehow you th- a thing that I experienced I was the cabaret law you know like sure. I saw a bar got shut down mm-hmm. for people dancing and which is just the most ridiculous thing that you can't even believe that it's a real yeah. law somehow you got involved in this um battle repeal wi- effort mm-hmm. yeah um so what happened I mean you you started having people come in and and saying you can't dance here or, or well, uh, it, it goes way back. Okay, uh, so, yeah. so the, I had always heard about the, the cabaret law from people that were like a little more, uh, old, you know, a little older than me and a little more, yeah. uh, you know, authentic in the scene or whatever. They're just older. Sure. But you know, people that were, you know, uh, you know, doing stuff at plant bar like yourself, yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, the cabaret law, like, you can't legally dance in New York City. And you can kind of tell you would see signs up in places, yeah. like, oh, you can't dance. 
and uh, some places just wouldn't have DJs because of that, and some places would have protocols or whatever, and you would hear all these rumors about it. You'd be like, yo, this is fucking crazy. This yeah. is like so dumb. How can you be this dumb? But it wasn't as bad after the Giuliani, and then we had Bloomberg, and it didn't seem as enforced. For yeah, a while. but this is the thing, though, is it was always enforced. They stopped enforcing it against people that looked like us, uh, and they went after uh, overwhelmingly the, uh, the Dominican club or the yeah, exactly rap party. Caribbean spots, uh, Latino spots. Uh, That's who they, uh, in you know. I guess I haven't been to too many of those. Yeah, yeah, same. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, so they started, you know, like. Uh, you know, they they laid off of white people, but also not for nothing, white people during this time, during Bloomberg, we weren't dancing that much. Yeah. You know, it, it slowed down after Giuliani shut everything down. So Bossa opens up and uh, we're like the one place like, you know, we're just so stupid and full of ourselves. We're like, we're a f- techno club, you know, seven nights a week. Yeah. We don't give a fuck. Yeah. And... Um, we have a New York Times article comes out. It's like the '90s are back. Boy, it's always the New York Times that brings yeah, yeah. everybody down. And so they, uh, the uh, March Task Force. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. No. But they're an interdepartmental, uh, uh, you know, government uh, city agency. It's like the health department, uh, NYPD, uh, fire department, uh, like EPA or some environmental shit. Um, Liquor, uh, state liquor authority and some other whatever. They all come in at once. And the idea is they just like blitzkrieg you with these uh, violations, tickets. And they're so expensive and uh, impossible to comply with. You either just shut down or you uh, adjust your business to be like, you know, like a a reclaimed wood um, uh, grilled cheese bar, like artisanal (laughs) grilled cheese bar. So they come by us with the uh, a copy of the, the New York Times article on a clipboard. And, of course, it's like 1 a.m. Uh, on, like, a, a Friday night. They raid us or whatever, and they get us for, like, a dozen violations. Who was DJing? You know, I have no clue. I'm just curious. I, I know one time Lauren Flax and uh, Gavin Russo. Raina Rusum okay. were uh, DJing. But, I, but we got raided a few times. Okay. <laughs> all blends together but you know i know that the party was not like Raging. a wild yeah. drug party yeah. you know it's like mostly people in like their 30s with like good jobs drinking an ipa just like yeah just like barely like this you yeah. know yeah. and they're like you know they treated us like it was like uh, like a sex dungeon like you know meth torture chamber or something and, and wh- when you, the cops come in and they're like Yelling at you and stuff. Oh and yeah, ha- handcuff you or, or no, or no, just, no, just uh, no serious. They, no, it was they turn the lights on, they shine flashlights in everybody's faces, oh. and they write you a bunch of tickets. Some of the tickets they wrote us for, or some of the tickets they issued to us, uh, we were we weren't even guilty of, um, and we're just like, hey, uh, you know, like one of them was, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, liability insurance. And I'm like, yeah, we do. They're like, uh, no, you don't. I'm like, okay, I'll show it to you right now. Yeah, Nobody like, asked me for like, it. No, no, no. They're like, uh, no, it's too late. The tic- you, tickets all already been issued or whatever. <sighs> so they shut down our backyard, amongst other things, and then they came back again, and then we had to, like, stop dancing altogether. And then a couple years, uh, you know, they threatened to take away our liquor license. I had to go to, I had to, go to court. I had to go to criminal court for cabaret, and then I had to go... Uh, and essentially, uh, like, beg the state liquor authority and their own, like, court system to not revoke my liquor license. And the crazy thing is, like, the judges, like, actually act like you're this, like, like Ted Bundy or some shit for letting people dance. <laughs> it's it's hard to take it seriously. And yeah. then and, and then that affects your attitude towards this judge. So it's a problem, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And so then, uh, you know, some time goes on and we're like, hey, hey we're going to sneak back into yeah. letting people dance again. <laughs> and so we start, you know, business as usual. We're doing great. And then what happened was the uh, ghost ship 
uh, fire tragedy. Oh, geez. More New York Times. Yeah, which if uh, you know the listeners uh, at home don't know, uh, a uh, a big DIY warehouse in Oakland went up in flames, and like thirty something people. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, thirty something people died, and and that's absolutely horrifying and tragic, and certainly. It, it, it was like a wake up call that like anybody involved in this shit needs to pay attention to safety. But I, don't, I don't understand the. I guess it just brings focus back on the scene. But uh, I don't know what it has to do with you. really. It, it has nothing to do with dancing. Yeah. People didn't dance and no. a fire started. No, 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 absolutely not. It has to do with, you know, fire code or, right. you know, like the fact that they had one exit that was blocked by a bunch of wood. And yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it has nothing to do with dancing is 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 the point i feel like you know what i just said was like kind of insensitive to the the ghost ship thing but i, 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 I didn't mean that it's okay i'm not offended <laughs> somebody might be but i'm yeah not. well if anybody is i'm i'm really am it was terrible sorry it, I it, sort of it was about terrible it. you know but uh, uh, uh in uh it's okay <laughs> i'm not offended um. so the 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 point i was trying to what what happened after that is there's this sort of hysteria across the the uh, the nation that we're letting people throw these unlicensed parties, um, so we have to stop that before another tragedy happens and yeah. it gets blamed on the, mm-hmm. the the cities again, and so they started coming into to my place, the fire department, constantly, several times a week, right after this, and uh, they come in and they inspect the place, and we're all up to code, a hundred percent up to code. And they're just being, like, really sort of hostile towards us, um, you know, like, grilling us. And I'm like, yo, look, man, we did everything you guys have asked us, plus more. Yeah. And they're like, well, you're on this list of a uh, place that throws uh, pop-up parties or whatever that is. Yeah, and, and you're like, we knew some of these people that died. They're part yeah. of our scene. Like, uh, uh, we care, you know. Exactly. And I'm like, look, we care about safety. We've yeah. done everything plus what you guys have asked us to and yeah. um there's nothing unsafe about this and then they come in one time and it's like you know probably at like 8 p.m and they're doing like the the tough guy you know we need to see your papers thing again i'm like you were here fucking three days ago and there's like one guy this almost never happens at like 8 p.m who's just like dancing by himself on the dance floor and i'm like oh my god like they're like you know, mean mugging them. I'm like, oh my God, they're about to say something. And this guy's like, look, you know, like, uh, we're going to let it slide this one time. Just this one time because it's only one guy. Yeah. But you know, you're not allowed to have dance in here. We'll shut you down for that. And I'm like, yo, dude, like, you're being serious with me right now. Your accent is great, by the way. Oh. <laughs> 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 I, I have, uh, you know, uh, you know, New York. Uh, you got it I in have like NYPD uh, relatives. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, he's like, I don't care. The rules are the rules. You know, we don't want this. We let this happen. And then there's, God forbid, there's uh, an incident comes back on us. Like, we can't let it happen. It's like, this one, you, you're fine this time. And then we were like, okay, you know, like, and we're hearing about them doing this to all these other places. And they're, they're like, they're going to use this as the fucking, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, That's the, the first, the, the the first Reichs, report. Yeah. The Reichstag fire yeah. or whatever to shut down everything again. And there's no legal recourse yeah. whatsoever. So we started this, uh, you know, like, uh, what would you call it? Like an activist group or whatever. Yeah. And teamed up with some other people and gave a bunch of speeches, gave like a town hall thing. And and, and for, for other people that uh, maybe face some sort of similar situation where they're being... Uh, uh, oppressed I don't know it's kind of mm-hmm. lame but uh what 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 did you do you just you started uh you got p- some press or you uh, you went and met people or h- h- what, what what was the plan of action or um what do you think well the big thing was we uh we got some press uh I I, I teamed up uh with some other people that were kind of popular Frankie DeKaza Hutchinson who does Disc Woman who has like a really big, uh, you know, uh, media presence, and uh, Nikki Brown, who uh, was like the head of like Boiler Room North America, and both of them are just, you know, they just super hard, effective workers, 
and we're like, yeah, fuck it, we're gonna do this, we're gonna save dance music or whatever. And what 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 did what what did you do? Like, uh, how did you do it? You just yeah. The first thing we did is uh, there was already this town hall thing going on at Market Hotel because everybody's like all you know getting shut m- down. Yeah, ruffled up about by what's gonna happen. Um, because of the ghost ship thing, and, and people are also concerned, like, yeah. how do we stop this? What's a sensible solution to this? And we said, you know, th- there was another group called the New York City Artist Coalition that had, like, a very uh, broad, uh, what do you call, like, your not your campaign, but the policies that they're pushing for. What uh, is that called? I, don't, uh, oh, th- I think we had the same question. The other, uh, uh. Ah. I don't know. A- anyway, they had a lot of uh, we had the same policies bouquet. they were asking for. Okay, it's a really simple term that I know it's on the tip. We had this exact same word really? we were looking for in the la- in the, the leg what one, and, and I can't remember it again. We need Francois here to tell me. Yeah, so th- they had like a really broad. They 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 wanted a lot of things, and we were like, here's this one thing that no one can defend. Yeah. You know that we and we feel that we could really actually make a difference. So we put this like, you know, team together, like all star raver personalities. And then we had uh, Nicole Brunecki, who uh, has a, a record label called New York Tracks, but she's also like a, a, a lawyer. A lawyer, yeah. And very serious about her job. She came on with us. We just took this like sort of tough, like, uh, but it was through the pro through the press mostly first or well we started at this town hall and we invited everybody to this town hall we invited everybody in the press and you know i went to school i worked for for like a decade trying to like make it as like uh you know a journalist and i i failed at it pretty bad but i made a lot of contacts okay and also not for nothing bossa nova is the only place that you can afford to see uh, dance music if you're a journalist in New York City. Okay. <laughs> so we know all these people, yeah. and we tell them about it. They show up. We get some press, and uh, in New York City, uh, politicians don't. Yeah. G- generally speaking, they're not operating on what's ethical. They're it's more sort of optics. D- yeah, and uh, if you're getting press for something, if you take this on. Uh, it helps you get reelected, and everybody's uh, trying to get uh, reelected. Uh, uh. So we, um, uh, although I will say, every almost everybody that worked with us really believed in it and were really good people. But at the same time, they're getting thrown thousands of good causes every day. Yeah. So this guy uh, Rafael Espinal, who's a city councilman in Bushwick in East New York, and is into like you know dance culture and stuff. Young guy, he was like the you know he really fought for us he was your inside man yeah and he gave a couple speeches on it or whatever and after that uh you know people started you know being converted or whatever at first we were just ignored by everybody then once you start getting you know some press they're like okay well i don't want to be the one who is uh against this uh, against dancing in new york city it just doesn't sound cool so so that really is uh, you know the checks and balances is is that the press really helped absolutely helped you like you would you you know if someone else was in a similar situation where they were doing something that was not terrible and, and they wanted to help bring attention to yourself through the press and and this was the way that you were able to continue on with what you're doing sure yeah and and so you know you got you you garnered all this attention with with help from uh, several people absolutely uh, and uh um, thank you very much everyone who was involved yeah, in that you. uh i never thought that that would happen is that one day you know I you know, you like saw like you would see, you know, these YouTube videos of you like wearing like a white shirt <laughs> and like some other people around. That one white I di- shirt. I yeah. didn't know other people around. Um, I never I don't know. I know Nicole, but I don't I don't know the other people. Um, you would see like these YouTube videos of you like being all serious. And yeah. And, and then uh, and then one day you, you never expected it. And you're like uh, the cabaret law is repealed. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. You know. Like, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, probably the proudest moment of my life i was yeah we were happy you know it seemed like you know there was like a 50 50 chance we could make it happen it's just up to some dude yes uh, yeah kind of yeah i mean there was i I think one thing that people don't realize 
especially in New York City, is that uh, city council is extremely powerful. They deal with a budget that is bigger than uh, a lot of the states. states. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also, they're very accessible. And no, everybody throws these uh, hissy fits on social media constantly, and I have too. I don't think there's yeah. anything wrong with that. But if, if you were to take just the, uh, a little bit of that energy and call up your city council member, <laughs> half the time they'll, they'll, they'll have a long conversation with you. Yeah, they'll yeah. have a meeting with you because most people don't think they're cool. But the truth is, is a lot of them really are cool people. Yeah. I think it's probably, you know, half of them or so are people of color. A lot of them are queer. Um a lot of them are young, and they're locals. They're from yeah, here. They absolutely. know the history of the, their neighborhoods. And yeah, stuff. and if, if if you live here in Greenpoint and uh, you have an issue, this guy's, uh, you know, singer songwriter outside your yeah, your no. building all day, all night, and yeah. you want to. There's so Francois w- was trying to get me to go. He goes to a lot. Of Francois from the lot who's helping me do this. He helped. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get me to go to some of the local meetings just to check it out because I work in the neighborhood and 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 I know a lot of the whatever. And he said sure. that just based on uh, interest or whatever, like spectacle factor even, it's worth it Absolutely. to go check out your local city council meeting or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, those of you, you know, go check. It's it's cool, you know. Check it out. I mean, even if, yeah. you, even it's just if you think about it, uh, something as a lot of you have, have been to court. Yeah. Just going to court is also pretty interesting, you know. So So maybe your local government is not such a bad place after all. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, you uh, people think that we're sort of helpless, and the only thing we can do is scream about stuff on the internet. And uh, I I felt that way too. And uh, then we learned that that wasn't the case, at least in our situation. Yeah. But a lot of times, you can call up your city council member, who is in charge of millions or tens of millions of dollars and maybe more i don't know i don't understand yeah. numbers but they're very 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 powerful yeah. and uh and so they, they'll hop on a phone call with you they'll listen to you and you know some of them are like progressive like very progressive you know what i mean they, they but, but do you think this is we also kind of live you, you forget that we live in new york city in brooklyn it's pretty progressive here sure but do you, I, I guess it's probably People, uh, but that's the thing too, is that you meet people. No matter where you go, people are generally pretty nice, on, yeah, on a personal level. So it seems like it could be that way wherever you are. You could probably. It's certainly uh, possible. Yeah. Most people don't want to hurt other people. You know, they think they're helping. Sure. Maybe. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I don't know what what the percentage is, but yeah. definitely a <laughs> lot of times, I think that's most the case. Most people you meet are nice. You know, someone's grandma, maybe they voted for Trump. They'll, they'll, they'll still make you some cookies and stuff and sure. you can have a conversation with them at least. Yeah. Maybe they can understand a little more where you're coming from. Yeah, but like there's a, you know, there's a like uh, a, a Black Panther that's a, a member of a, a city council. You know, like some of these people are, you know, pretty, pretty cool yeah. and they're accessible. But so Raphael was, you know, the, you know, really the catalyst who took it to the next level. And he, uh, you know, uh, gave some speeches about it and really, for the most part, let sort of the people who were involved in the scene, uh, you know, his constituents sort of guide, you know, the rhetoric or whatever. Yeah. And he was so it, uh, w- it, it was great it was so it was it was a press campaign sort of it was a political and a press campaign but that seemed to be where your power came from oh absolutely and then somehow through this this nightlife co- coalition was created is that a part of it or that was just uh, kind of i mean that was side note certainly connected to it um the fact that uh it just brought to light that you know new york city is in absolute you know war with any sort of culture yeah especially nightlife yeah. i think i mean if they would realize how many people come here to participate in nightlife it might uh yeah and you know what they do realize it it's like one of these yeah. things where uh, they've just gotten away with it for so long and they didn't want to like really disturb it but th- the big thing that happened is we did like a freedom 
of Information Act uh, request. And we got the data back about who was getting hit Ooh, with oh. these cabaret summons. Mm. And people like me, you know, I'm clearly, uh, you know, painfully Caucasian. Um, and, you know, probably 60% of the people in, uh, you know, in, in my, my bar, you know, yeah. fit into more like a uh, transplant gentrification class or whatever. Um, but we were the exception. Um, so, like, everybody's like, oh, my God, the cabaret law hit Bossa. But when you look at the data of the places they've been hitting forever and they hit regularly, it's, you know, it's all Latin and black places. So we didn't even, as soon as we saw the names of all the places, let's say 100 places had been hit in, uh, you know, in the past year, yeah. it's like, you know, you just read the names are in Spanish it's crazy, or it's, you know, like, uh, you know, Jimmy's uh, Caribbean hangout, yeah, uh, yeah. you know. But I mean, do you think that, I, it, so going on from there, did they, are those places doing better now or, or did that? Uh, I mean, who knows? They would be, uh, you know, better off to answer that question. But my understanding is that absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure it's far from. Uh, perfect. I mean, I know it's still terrible, but uh, what a weird thing. Uh, you know, they're they're not really shutting places down for dancing anymore. Yeah. And uh, the March Task Force, which is just this like, you know, this like evil and unnecessary super group that would come down and just shut your bar down for, uh, you know, ruthlessly. They've cut their uh, operations down to like maybe like one third. Okay. In the past, I don't know, decade or whatever. Yeah. So things are definitely way better. Yeah. Um, is there a lot of work to be done? Absolutely. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, but do you people who are more vulnerable are s still affected in a way that is. But do you think, but I don't know, maybe this is kind of a dickhead question, but uh, now that you're okay, are you still participating in this this discussion with this nightlife people? Uh, or Sort of, or yeah. You're just kind of like I'm. I made it through the this. I'm gonna run my business now, which it's it's, it's perfectly normal. Sure. Well, uh, honestly, I thought, um, I don't know if people believe this or not. I don't no. know if I would believe it. But what I thought was gonna happen, I, I thought participating in this was, if anything, gonna make it worse for my establishment. Um, because but I it's thought it's okay. Uh, y yeah, it, it did turn out. Uh, okay and i'm i'm very happy with the results yeah. but w when i s said okay i want to get involved in uh you know the political thing uh i didn't i didn't feel at l or at least i was telling myself that i didn't think it was a uh a selfish uh motive i thought if anything everybody my my partners and yeah, my yeah. employees are like yo they're gonna come shut us down for you running your well, but there's a stupid mouth and, you know maybe it's narcissistic no, in no, another think, no, around it, the way i thing. think a better way to say it is self-preservation well know? i d i didn't think it was gonna no, preserve us no but it, yeah. it did it, 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 and it's okay to do that you know like you're you you, you employ a lot of people you created a scene sure and uh, you know, thank you for for uh, oh, yeah, making it through that. It wouldn't have happened probably without you, and uh, whoever I, I I don't know exactly who else was involved, but uh, uh, the thing that I thought was from seeing you, I was like, wow, this he should just be a politician. Oh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I I don't know if, if that ever crossed your mind. Is is it, or you're just gonna keep running this bar, or uh, you're I still a young I man? I don't think I could really get into politics. I've Checker had passed. too. I've had too much fun. You've been arrested. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they'd bring that up, but uh, probably um, yeah. So, uh, so, so, Bossa Nova's doing fine now, and uh, it's okay. And yeah. It's running, running. You're not I'm still here, not dead yet. You, you, you got a, you still got a haircut and a clean clothes. <laughs> you, know, you should be okay. But, but a just one thing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up shortly. I know sure. we're, we're out of wine. Um, we don't want to go get the other bottle. Um, or maybe there's a oh sip. No, there's a, there's a sip there. left. Um, is that uh, along this t time? Uh, you put out a couple. You've been making music still um sure oh thank you um as as a and even uh, as a you had like a music project called dust yes and uh, i even play one of the tracks so i always pitch it down really slow oh really which one i don't remember what it is i think it's one on one of the alessandro releases okay uh, cool 
I don't, is that, that's what his label should be called, Alessandro. <laughs> but ma- from Mannequin Records. Um, but you've been somehow along the way. You also make music, which is not not bad. Oh, thank you. Um, I like some. Of, I mean, uh oh, what happened? One of the cameras just turned off, but we'll be okay. Oh, it came. Back. Oh, it's back. Okay. Um, but you've been putting out uh, music. Are you still doing that, or how did you find a time to do that also, or is it? Tell me uh, I mean, I it. still have free time, you know, like I, I probably work <laughs> 20 hours a week at uh, my bar and then I have a, a, a side gig that I do 20 hours a week at. Yeah, what is that? Um, soda Company, White oh, Label, right. Yerba oh, Mate that's Soda. Yeah. That's another bring up. It's that's not that uh, exciting. It's it's more of a, like I'm, I need to pay my bills. Kind I, of I wanted to, there was a, there was a warehouse underneath our, our repair shop that I wanted to get you guys. I was like, I want to get Yerba Mate in there. Sure. I think yeah. it was too expensive though. Yeah. I think, yeah, you were looking for it's a, a premium product. Ground Yerba level. Mate, yeah. Ground <laughs> level. But back to the music. Um, You were, you're, you're still doing, doing that or, or you find time to. Well, well dust ended a, c- a couple years ago. And that was and you with a couple other people or. Yeah. Me with, uh, Michael Sherburn who does, uh, he's got a group called earth boys, which okay. is like uh house music, feel good, uh, stoner house music. 707 Juno. Yeah. And then, uh, green jellyfish who is a, uh, um, visual artist and also like a noise artist and she's just an artist you know uh we did that together and then it fell apart uh a few years ago would you have like a big falling out um i wouldn't say a big falling out but um something happened you know we all had like our own little ego things and uh was it like about who got to stand in front no (laughs) i mean metaphorically (laughs) maybe (laughs) But for me, for me, I, like As a we, we were playing, you know, we were playing shows with like 700 people there or something. And to me, like I would I would let people annoy me to my death to be able to do that. To yeah. me, that like that everything I've ever wanted to do as a kid is just like play to like a room full of like super excited people dancing around. Like, And, and are you going to do are you doing it? You just put out another. Well, so, so now, several years later, I just released my first solo thing, which is called Liquid Soap. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's uh, the first album is like a concept, like uh, sort of like uh, fantasy, ancient civilization, like I, I gotta, I elf gotta, warfare thing. I remember the, I read the press and checked the clips, but then I like forgot about it or something because yeah. it's <laughs> such dark times. I, I don't blame you. There's no, no. I mean, I, I remember <laughs> like I, I got to find it again or something. But that's why it's good. To d- is are there records of it? Is it a vinyl? No, it was. It was, It's just digital. Yeah. yeah. See, that's a problem for some reason. I don't know why. It yeah. Ju- it sucks, but it is. It's like not doesn't exist in let. Sure. Yeah. Some kind of. I mean, it's it's very conducive to a digital release too. It's a it's a it's a mega mix. So it's an hour of help. seamless, Barclay, uh, you know, music. And it's it's all supposed to be like fantasy oriented. I'm gonna revisit. It's almost like a uh, like a funk master flex or like a <laughs> DJ Clue mixtape. Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. Except you should just put, all out t- put out a tape of it, man. Yeah, you know we you talked know about it at some point, but uh, just get get a tell the John Beal, put it on I, bank bank yo, records I, tape. I I I uh, I sent it to Beal. Yeah, he, I forget what he said, but you know, like whatever his loss, <laughs> your loss, Beal. <laughs> we'll I'll talk. We'll talk to him yeah. again. But I. I uh, and that is that. That's just under your name, John Barclay, or no? Liquid soap is liquid my, soap is my moniker. One time I worked at the pool at NYU, and I like there was this liquid soap, and one time it like gave me this weird rash. Oh, so yeah. I like anytime I go to a place that has liquid soap, I like even though you're supposed to like wash your hands at the bar, yeah. I like I'm afraid if the mold can grow in there. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. We want to be mold. like you know, I'm trying to be like intimidating. Is that and, like the pink kind? The pink kind that like doesn't leave the, s- the smell, doesn't leave your hand. Uh, I mean, I, I just general liquid. I soap. just thought like, yo, this shit is so weird. You know, what is this? We like rub it on our hands. We don't know what it's no. made out of. And Supposedly I w- makes this cleaner. And I won't. I also gave w- Willie Burns a rash. You know that weird stuff that people have so like so futuristic. Have like on their backpack the like hand sanitizer. Oh yeah, yeah. I won't use that either. Yeah. I'm too old. For I, that. I like a nice bar of soap. No matter how nasty it looks, I'll still use it. Some lava or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take the skin totally. right off. Yeah, so, so, um, uh, what, what, did we miss anything? What, what, oh, the, the, so you also, 
You're also the real the real way you're going to be rich is this uh, soda thing, though. Yerba mate. Me, I hope so. It hasn't proven that way so far, but yeah, I have a. Uh, Got to put more than twenty hours a week into it. I think. Yeah, I have a soda company. You know, but you're like a, a dis- but it's you're the American distributor. Is that no? The no, it's, all, it's 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 your company. company. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. And, and so, yeah. where does it made? Uh, we keep that secret. Oh, but uh, <laughs> around here at the Coca Cola factory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's made out of like a really big factory. That's what really the only place you can make this stuff. Yeah, but and uh, so you're gonna you're anybody yerba mate white label, white label yerba mate soda. And uh, is it available all over the place? Or? All over New York City. We just launched in Detroit, and we're supposed to launch in L.A. Um, yeah, you got to get Los Angeles, Portland, maybe yeah, Austin. I mean, it costs a lot of money to launch in each place. Well, shipping so. is expensive, I guess. Huh? Yeah, it's all free. And glass bottles. Oh, yeah. What's the, uh, is there like a, uh, this is a, I don't know, maybe not interesting question to some people, but is there a better solution than glass bottles? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, plastic is a lot easier to but ship. Is, but Is there some new kind of plastic really that's bad made out of? Uh, my, understa- not, my understanding is no, no, you know. So you're just nice. that's so that that seems I mean that got it's got to add a lot of weight to the you have to like start your own shipping company or something. Yeah, I mean the idea is that you get big enough like Coca Cola they'll they'll be producing put, in every state or whatever you know. I mean? So the, you don't have to the ship it as them. far. Huh. But right oh, now so that, we're that's new, that, so. that's the it, that's the secret is that you have oh because yeah Coca Cola they have one in Dallas they have one in Atlanta they have, so you have Precisely. local local manufacturing maybe you know some like beer people that'll like add it to their some local breweries you could work yeah with. that would be nice maybe because yeah. you got like a i'm sure you've thought about this already but you know like austin has a big brew culture maybe portland does too sure maybe some of these guys could add soda to their yeah the the issue is these uh factories or co-packers are set up uh so it doesn't really make sense for them to produce something like under 5,000 cases. Oh, okay. Because all the, it's all, it's all set up time, you know. You set up the, the process with them for a couple weeks or, you know, How really long? several months. And then they spend half the day, f- you know, batching your soda and then just a few hours of running it. Because yeah. these are like industrial yeah. plants, you know. And uh, how long does it, does a... Is there a shelf life to it? How long is they're it? They're shelf stable. They're they're good for at least two years. Okay, so you're, yeah. But and then you're doing it in New York City. It doesn't make sense. It's like the most expensive place to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we don't. We haven't Sorry. completely figured out the economics. I know yet. you're tired now. I don't. <laughs> no, no, no. Have you thought <laughs> about these things? I just don't want to give away because you know there's competitors out there. You know, <laughs> yerba mate is actually pretty hard to work with. We found out. So uh, we and found some and good it's guys. A t- it's a tea, right? Well, it's not technically a tea. Anything that's technically a tea comes from just one plant, the tea plant. But it's traditionally brewed like tea. Like tea, and it's also caffeinated like tea. So it, it's a uh, yerba mate is like a South American rainforest holly, and traditionally it's drank. Yeah, this is my. Yeah, yeah no, you got I, me into I've like had it capitalism with the, with, here. With the, with the copper straw. So yeah, 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 yeah. The bombilla. Yeah. So traditionally it's drank down there. And uh, it's brewed like a tea, and it's, uh, you know, drank like a tea. Yeah. But it's not technically tea. And then, you know, there was a uh, American, uh, no, I'm sorry, a Cuban company that's still around, although it's moved to, I think, Miami, called Materva. They were the first, you know, notable uh, Yerba Mate soda company. So you got beef with them? No, oh, no. The, those are the godfathers okay. there, you know. And then there's... Uh, Club Mate, which a lot of you know dance people know, is the German thing. And oh, see, uh, see, I, my, I thought naively is that you were importing the German kind. Oh no, no, no. So see, you started no, a new company. I, 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 we used to import the. Oh, well, okay. we didn't import it. These hackers would, and I would drive uh, to. Um, see, that's what I thought you were doing. I didn't know you were making. In Applebee's in Long Island <laughs> to pick up. Uh, Club Mate. Sounds about right. Yeah, uh, you know, once a month. And the problem was, you know, we, we were the only bar in, I think, in this, uh, what is this called? The, the tr- New World? <laughs> uh, the Hemisphere? Western in, Hemisphere. In the Americas yeah. that sold Club Mate. 
Mm-hmm. So people would people would like freaked out like, oh, my God, they have Club Mate. We have to go, you know, and so <laughs> we would sell a ton of it. But the issue was it's so expensive to ship it, you know, yeah. from Europe. It's just. Well, I mean, if you imagine you, it, shipping one record costs twenty three dollars. Yeah. And they, and what is that? That's like tw- ten records per bottle or something. Exactly. Oh, geez. Crazy. So distribution, it, it, it didn't make sense. We tried to like get some conversations going with, uh, you know, Club Mate or whatever. And they like couldn't possibly have given so less of a fuck okay. about us. And we're like, OK, how much would it cost to make uh, your own to make our own? And while we're at it, you know, uh, can we sort of, you know, make the ingredients a little better? You know, instead of like, I don't know what they're using, sucralose syrup or whatever. Yeah, we're yeah. using like, you know, organic cane sugar, you know. Sweet. Or I whatever. Know. We're like a little more with the times or whatever. And uh, you yeah. Should, you should so just work on that. You should quit all this. I mean, that's what I'm doing mostly now. Or, 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 or be a politician. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, let's end it on that, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, John Barclay, for uh, stopping by. Uh, Anyone that is in New York City, stop by the Bossa Nova Civic Club. Have a, a white label mate. Please. What do, you, what do you recommend they mix it with? Just straight or, or with a... Um, I mean, if you if you like alcohol, you know, wh- whatever your favorite spirit is. It's a soda, so it's like a ginger ale. You can mix it with vodka, tequila, whiskey. What's your favorite? I like it with mezcal. But mezcal. That's because mezcal. I like okay. mezcal. Yeah, you know? all right. I know that's like sort of a... Uh, trendy yeah trendy like thing natural but orange ta- wine yeah it tastes good I orange like wine it. tastes good too though, i like yeah. it too you know that's why it's popular exactly um um or uh they can check out your new your sort of new album called liquid soap on Bandcamp. uh well my moniker is liquid soap it's on 2mr records um yeah the release is called uh why won't they put out a record what a bunch of jerks yeah, they they I think they just uh, I it's think it's a just weird me. Time. I think it's just me. They don't want to put out a record for, but no, they, they do should, put out records. They should put it out. It's but it's also yeah. strange times. Record sales are definitely down. So sure, it, maybe they can put like a best of like a sure yeah a sampler and uh, and then uh, and uh, and buy a uh, soda or something. I don't know what else. To say. Yeah, did I miss why the hell not? Did I miss anything? Do you need any? Do you have any? No, other that's input? it. That's that's more than enough. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thanks. Uh, see you guys all next time. Thank you.